committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time pursuant to committee rule two, house rule 11, clause two, the chairman may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment for which a recorded vote is ordered. We welcome back to the committee, uh, the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, and we'll, uh, we'll ask the gentleman if he'd lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pursuant to notice, we call up H.R. 6570, the Protect Liberty End Warrantless Surveillance Act, for purpose of markup, and move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 6570. Without objection, amend. the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, uh, the sponsor of the legislation, Mr. Biggs, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank, thank you for hearing this, and I thank the members of this committee that served on the task force that you appointed, Mr. McClintock from California, Ms. Lee from Florida, uh, as we were able to work with our uh, Intel counterparts uh, on much, who agree with much of what we have in our bill today. Congress enacted the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978 in response to revelations that the federal government had seriously abused warrantless surveillance resulting in rampant privacy violations. Despite efforts to rein this in, the federal government has continued to use its powers to improperly and often illegally spy on American citizens. In February of 2020, Director Ray testified before the committee and told the American people that they should not lose any sleep over the vast majority of FISA applications. Former Director Comey labeled FISA a top-tier FBI program. Despite these claims, in 2019 and 2020, Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz exposed how the FBI had violated its authorities under FISA by improperly spying on Trump campaign associations. The reports revealed that the FBI failed to recognize the significant risks posed by systemic noncompliance with the Woods procedure. Again, in May 2023, Special Counsel John Durham released a report on FBI's crossfire hurricane investigation, which not only supported Inspector General Horowitz's findings, but also found that political and confirmation bias led the FBI to lie to the FISC in order to improperly spy on the Trump campaign for an entire year. In April of this year, we held a hearing with Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz and members of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board to discuss the FISA program and to determine whether reforms to Section 702 are needed. It became increasingly clear that significant reforms are necessary, and in July we held another hearing to further discuss these needed reforms. At the end of this year, the end of this month, Section 702 of FISA will expire. Reports in recent years have exposed the government's and specifically uh, FB, the FBI's abuse of this program. A law designed to provide tools to collect foreign intelligence and prevent terrorist attacks has been warped into a domestic spy tool used to target Americans. In 2021, the FBI queried the communications of more than 3.3 million U.S. persons, wrongfully. In 2022, the FBI was still conducting hundreds of U.S. persons' queries per day. A recent FISA court opinion revealed the FBI conducted more than 278,000 improper searches of U.S. persons' communications in 2022. These backdoor warrantless searches included Americans who were in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021. These backdoor warrantless searches included Americans who participated in Black Lives Matter protests during the summer of 2020, and they included Americans who were in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021, even though they had nothing to do with the riots uh, near and in the Capitol. They included searches for our colleagues on the Intelligence Committee, Congressman Darren LaHood, an unnamed U.S. Senator and a state senator. They included warrantless searches of 19,000 donors to a congressional campaign, ostensibly to see if any of them were influenced by foreign entities. These actions violated the privacy and civil liberties of Americans and likely infringed on their Fourth Amendment rights. FISA Section 702 explicitly states that it may only be used to target non-U.S. persons located abroad for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence information. But it's clear that the government is using communications acquired through this program to conduct backdoor searches of Americans' communications. And most of this is done without even having obtained a warrant. 
Section 702 information acquired without a warrant can later be used by the FBI in criminal prosecutions unrelated to foreign intelligence or national security. The FBI has misused privileged spying powers to conduct rogue surveillance on innocent Americans. We cannot allow that to continue. I have called for serious reforms of FISA for many years. The FBI and federal intelligence agencies use scare tactics to convince Congress that these unchecked powers are the only method available to protect our nation from harm. Well, every American should be scared to know federal agents are spying on them, even if they have nothing to hide. We need to prohibit warrantless surveillance of Americans and hold accountable any federal official who violates the civil liberties of Americans. To prevent further abuses of Section 702 by the FBI and broader intelligence community, the Protect Liberty and End Warrantless Surveillance Act re requires all intelligence agencies and the FBI to obtain a warrant from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court before conducting any query of a U.S. person. It would also drastically reduce the number of FBI officials authorized to conduct such queries. The bill will also bring much needed reforms to the FISC, increase transparency, and ensure that those who violate the civil liberties of Americans will be held accountable for their actions. The bill closes the data broker loophole to ensure the government cannot make an end run around the Fourth <coughs> Amendment to purchase the data of Americans, the data of Americans, which was unanimously supported by this committee earlier this year. <coughs> However, this bill will not restrict the intelligence community from acting quickly in the face of impending danger due to its reasonable ex exceptions based on the exigent circumstance of each situation. Additionally, if surveilling an innocent U.S. person's data is so vital to national security, the intelligence communi community may get the consent of that U.S. person that they intend to surveil without needing to get a warrant. With these exceptions, this bill ensures that the government must have a good reason if it wants to target Americans' data. It is clear that reforms to FISA are desperately needed, and the Protect Liberty and End Warrantless Surveillance Act will implement significant reform. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Before I recognize the ranking member, let me again thank the, uh, the chairman of the Crime Subcommittee and the sponsor of the legislation, as well as Mr. McClintock and Ms. Lee, who worked on this, uh, who focused on this issue for several months, and our entire uh, side of the dais, as well as our staff. And I also want to thank uh, ranking member Nadler, where we, we worked um, for a number of weeks and months on, on this legislation and have had great conversations with him and their, our staff and your staff, as well as uh, Ms. Jayapal and others on the committee. Um, this, is, this is nice to have it, the committee work this way from, from time to time, particularly on something of, uh, of, this, of this level of importance. And uh, so we appreciate that. And with that, I would yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. I thank the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important markup today. The Protect Liberty and End Warrantless Surveillance Act, or the Protect Liberty Act, is the product of a year-long effort in which I was proud to join Chairman Jordan and Mr. Biggs in leading. Over the past year, the committee held two hearings on FISA that helped frame the important issues that called out for reform. We brought in government watchdogs from the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board and the DOJ Inspector General, who described the uh, FBI's ongoing compliance issues with Section 702. We heard from witnesses from the civil liberties community about the impact of these violations, and we consulted with a range of experts on what changes were needed to help prevent inappropriate queries of the FISA 702 database. And we engaged with the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the other agencies that use this authority, an exchange that leaves, I suspect, virtually every member of this committee convinced that Section 702 is essential to national security and ought to be reauthorized in some form. This legislation is the product of that exhaustive process. On Monday, Mr. Biggs and I unveiled the Protect Liberty Act, bipartisan legislation that would reauthorize and reform Section 702 and would require robust civil liberties protections throughout the Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act. I anticipate that we will hear that word a lot today, bipartisan. It is not a word often used to describe our committee. But the process that led to this bill was one of true bipartisanship, one where members on both sides of the aisle sat down together to find common ground. FISA reform will only be successful when we work together, and I thank the chairman for allowing that bipartisan process to play out. Let me take a moment to put my support for this important legislation into context. Like many of my colleagues, I have never supported the bill to reauthorize Section 702 on the House floor. I have in the past worked with my Republican colleagues on this committee to reach a compromise that would place appropriate restraints on the government's use of this powerful authority. 
Unfortunately, those thoughtful approaches were never presented to the full House for a vote. Indeed, one wonders if we would even be having this debate today if the House had passed the bipartisan effort that I advanced with former Chairman Bob Goodlatte Bob Goodlat back in 2017. Today in this hearing room, we have an opportunity to put this conversation back on track. For too long, FISA has enabled the surveillance of Americans without adequate safeguards to protect our civil liberties. No one disagrees that our intelligence agencies play an essential role in keeping us safe. But it is unfair to expect that the individuals who carry the grave responsibility of rooting out terrorist threats should also be required to make judgments about how to protect the constitutional rights of those surveilled. They need Congress to enact guardrails. And in Congress, that role falls to the House Judiciary Committee. Time and again, the FISA Court has found that the government overstepped in its use of FISA authorities. Nowhere is this lack of compliance more apparent than in the case of FBI querying of U.S. person information contained in the 702 database. Although Section 702 authorizes only the targeting of non-U.S. persons who are outside the United States, we know that massive amounts of U.S. person data are swept up under this programmatic surveillance. We also know from what reporting is available that the government has a lot of this data and that much of it could not have been obtained without a warrant had they tried to collect it directly. And even though there are some constraints in when the FBI can query U.S. person identifiers, those protections do not necessarily work. For example, restrictions on FBI queries did not prevent searches of over 100 Black Lives Matter protesters. They did not prevent the batch query of over 19,000 donors to an unnamed congressional candidate. And they did not stop over 278,000 other noncompliant FBI queries of the 702 database that occurred just last year, 278,000. The single most important reform we can put in place to combat these abuses is a warrant requirement for U.S. person queries. This legislation will do just that. The legislation before us today would impose a probable cause warrant requirement on persons, on, I'm sorry, on searches using U.S. person identifiers with certain reasonable exceptions such as cybersecurity cases and in exigent circumstances. It would also significantly limit the number of FBI personnel who can conduct U.S. person queries, increase the types of cases where an amicus must be appointed at the FISA court, and impose much needed additional transparency to the entire system. Although I expect this bill to pass today with overwhelming bipartisan consensus, I know our approach will have its critics. Some will say we have gone too far towards reform. Some will say we have not done nearly enough. And some will attempt to convince us that a mostly symbolic warrant requirement one that exists on the books but applies to no more than a handful of cases a year constitutes meaningful reform. With respect, they are wrong. I believe we have struck the right balance here, and perhaps the only balance that can pass the House of Representatives at this time. A warrant requirement like the one imposed in the Protect Liberty Act is the reform we need to protect Americans and to allow surveillance laws to continue to keep us safe while also protecting our essential liberties. To end where I began, I have never voted to reauthorize Section 702. I am deeply uncomfortable, as we all should be, with the, notion that it, it, with the notion that it is permissible for the government to search our most private communications without a warrant simply because they were aiming for non-U.S. persons overseas. I understand, however, that Section 702 authority has become increasingly important to our national security. I recognize that letting it expire altogether would not be wise. The Protect Liberty Act was written with that reality in mind. Although I have long advocated for a range of reforms to the surveillance powers we vest in the intelligence community, federal law enforcement, and our state and local partners, this bill is not a catch-all for every reform we, we might like to see enacted one day. It is instead a balanced first step designed to pre preserve the underlying authority while curbing the abuses that most threaten our privacy. I thank Mr. Biggs, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, and the bipartisan group of civil liberties and national security experts we consulted for their hard work getting us to this point. I urge all members to support this legislation, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Well said. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, without objection, all of their opening statements will be included in the record. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona for the purpose of, of offering an amendment.
in the nature of a substitute. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for the purposes of amendment. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be quick. Uh, also, I wanted to thank Mr. Nadler uh, for his opening statement and for working with us on this important issue, and Ms. Jayapal, Ms. Lofgren, and the others um, across the aisle and the staff from both uh, both sides of the aisle in this who've worked so hard to deliver this bill and this, uh, this amendment. The most um, important aspect of this amendment in the nature of a substitute is the, uh, the section dealing with uh, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act, something that passed out of here um, uh, almost unanimously. I think it was unanimously with one vote voting present. And with that, Mr. Chairman, other than that, uh, it does nothing to alter the substance of the bill, and I'll yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today to bring overdue reform to Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We all acknowledge the need to enact comprehensive reforms designed to protect American civil liberties However, we also face a critical need to reauthorize Section 702 of FISA. In a bipartisan effort, members of the House Judiciary Committee have met with representatives from the House Intelligence Committee, industry experts, coalition groups, and the intelligence community to attempt to find common ground in ensuring the preservation of our constituents' constitutional rights while also defending our homeland from acts of terror. In particular, I'd like to thank Chairman Jordan, Mr. Biggs, Mr. McClintock, and our Democrat colleagues on the committee who have worked so hard in this endeavor. In an environment of pervasive threats of terrorism on our homeland, tools like Section 702 are a critical part of preventing conspiracies against the United States. However, in its current form, American civil liberties are at risk of being violated. We are gravely concerned about past instances of abuse and the potential for future abuses of the 702 querying program and of the Fisk Court. We are committed to ensuring that intelligence tools are used for the American people, not against the American people. And the work we have done this Congress will ensure that we protect civil liberties while we also protect our homeland. The Protect Liberty Act will strengthen civil liberty protections and ensure that FISA remains an effective instrument for terrorist surveillance by implementing strong reforms to use oversight, and penalties for abuse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Mr. Chair, I support H.R. 6750, and I urge its passage, the revelations by the Department of Justice Inspector General, by Special Counsel Durham, and by the FISA Court have shown a disappointing and frankly alarming pattern of abuse by the FBI and its use of U.S. person data. Uh, these abuses have led to an increased calls for changes to Section 702 from both sides of the aisle. For example, the President's own Intelligence Advisory Board stated in its July 2023 report that complacency, a lack of proper procedure, and the sheer volume of Section 702 activity led to the FBI's inappropriate use of Section 702 authorities. Similarly, the Bipartisan Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board was unanimous in stating, although all U.S. person queries by the intelligence community present privacy and civil liberties risks, FBI queries procedures and practices pose the most significant threats to American privacy. But both groups have also been unanimous in the value of Section 702 to U.S. domestic and national security. I think our bipartisan bill strikes the right balance between our need to protect national security with our need to protect civil liberties and our Fourth Amendment rights as Americans. First, H.R. 6750 will curb the FBI's abuses of Section 702 by restricting the, US, the use of U.S. person data. This bill will limit the number of FBI employees able to perform U.S. person queries, requiring that queries will only be for the purposes of retrieving foreign intelligence information and subject U.S. person queries to the same evidentiary standard as other domestic search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, 
It also provides more transparency into FISA court or FISC to ensure what happened with FISA application of Carter Page will never happen again. Finally, it provides for more accountability measures to ensure those who continue to abuse the query procedures face steep penalties for their actions. I want to thank my colleagues from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, for leading on this important issue, as well as Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Nadler for their good faith negotiations to get this bill to a place where I believe it will pass overwhelmingly out of this committee. And I urge the committee to support the bill. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Washington who's been uh, working tirelessly on this legislation. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Gentlemen amendment to the Arizona amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6570 offered by Ms. Shia Paul of Washington. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady is recognized on her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by thanking you, thanking uh, Ranking Member Nadler and Representative Biggs for offering this very strong legislation to overhaul FISA and to protect Americans' Fourth Amendment right to privacy. I'm very proud to be an original co-sponsor of this bill, the Protect Liberty and End Warrantless Surveillance Act. This bill is a huge step forward to protecting Americans' privacy and civil liberties by simply requiring the government to get a warrant before searching for Americans' communications, fixing the loophole that currently allows the government to purchase Americans' sensitive data without a warrant, and more. I also want to just take a moment to thank my colleague on the other side of the aisle, who I've also worked very closely with on these issues, Representative Warren Davidson, who is not on the committee, but whose leadership has been critical. And Representative Zolofgren, who's unable to be here, but whose long-term leadership has been essential. I want to offer a friendly amendment to strengthen the bill by uh, addressing reverse targeting, a practice where intelligence agencies select foreign targets with the purpose of securing communications of persons in the United States. We know that despite Congress's direction to intelligence agencies to minimize the retention and use of Americans' information incidentally collected under Section 702, the agencies have actually done just the opposite. Last year alone, they conducted 200,000 warrantless backdoor searches for Americans' private communications. They've also regularly abused the weak protections that are in place, including baseless backdoor searches for people exercising their First Amendment right to protest, journalists, and even members of Congress. This bill takes an important step in requiring a warrant to search Americans' communications records, which would substantially reduce the risk of surveillance abuses, warrants, uh, surveillance abuses, but warrants alone cannot eliminate the risk entirely, particularly for willful abuses. Similarly, a warrant requirement cannot prevent Section 702 databases from being hacked or otherwise accessed improperly. Accordingly, it's important not just to protect Americans' privacy at the point that agents are performing searches, but also at the time of collection. My amendment would accomplish that by strengthening existing prohibitions on the reverse targeting of Americans. That is, collection supposedly targeting a foreign person located abroad, but actually intending to collect the information of an American in contact with a foreign person. Currently, Section 702 prohibits the government from targeting foreign person if the purpose of the surveillance is to spy on an American. In practice, that means that even if the purpose of the surveillance is almost entirely to gather intelligence about an American, the government can still evade the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement as long as it has even a minor interest in the foreign person as well. Some may argue that the intent of the law is clear, but the standard is far too weak to protect Americans' constitutional rights. There should be no shortcuts to warrantlessly surveil Americans. Under my amendment, the government could not target a foreign person if a significant purpose of the surveillance is to spy on an American in contact with that foreign person. When the government wants to surveil Americans, it should be required to get a warrant or a FISA Title I order. It should not be able to evade this requirement because it also has some interest in a foreign person in contact with an American. If that were the case, the government would in theory be able to capture warrantlessly all of an American's international communications. And the Constitution simply doesn't allow this. 
I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this amendment to strengthen this excellent bill. We must ensure robust protections for Americans throughout the process, not just at the query stage. And aside from this particular issue, I hope we can continue working together to ensure that all surveillance happens pursuant to congressional authorities. I'm also eager for us to further crack down on data brokers and go further to protect Americans' medical and mental health records, financial records, and other private sensitive information. In the meantime, I am really delighted at the outcome of the bill to date. It's a crucial step to protect Americans from warrantless surveillance, and I hope to see it swiftly move to the House and Senate floors and urge President Biden to sign it into law without delay. I yield back. The lady yields back. The gentleman, does the gentleman insist on his point of order? I withdraw my point of order. Point of order withdrawn. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady for the amendment and would hope that she would engage in a brief colloquy with me to discuss how the nature of this amendment to stop the reverse targeting that troubles us, that we've seen the Inspector General's report, interfaces with this executive order, this 12333 executive order. And so is the gentlelady confident that if the amendment were adopted, that there wouldn't be a mechanism for reverse targeting under, under that executive order. I yield. Uh, it doesn't touch 12333. I am confident that, um, that this is, a, an, exec this is a, an amendment that will help us to ensure that there's no um, evading of what we are all seeking, which is warrants and uh, authority to, to surveil Americans. I, I'm going to support the amendment. I think that it's, uh, it's, it's virtuous in that goal. Do, but does the gentlelady worry that if we leave the 12 triple three in place that there might be some effort to undermine the good work of the amendment and the underlying bill? As the gentleman knows, I have been worried about that. I continue to be worried about that. I think we're going to have to do everything we can to make sure that we're um, paying very close attention to this and, and uh, continuing to try to move forward and have authority over that particular issue. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about it because, you know, in my discussions with uh, Ms. Lofgren, who, as the gentlelady states, is a, is a recognized expert on, on this issue, I initially thought, well, let's just let this expire. It's been such an abused authority. Let's let it expire and see if we can design something anew that isn't littered with all of the loopholes that have allowed these abuses of people's civil liberties and what Ms. Lofgren expressed to me is that if we were to just allow the legislation to expire, that these executive orders would persist with the veneer of authority yeah. Yeah. and there wouldn't be the warrant requirements that we're all fighting for here. And so I, I am worried that all of this great effort that we've put into warrant requirements and our civil liberties is, is a bit illusory if what the Intel Committee is really arguing for is the preservation of this executive order that then allows the reverse targeting and, um, and, and the end run around the Fourth Amendment. And, and so that, I mean, that's a concern of mine that's gonna persist throughout this. It's not, certainly not a reason to oppose this good amendment, but I think we do need to acknowledge that there's a lot of work to be done. And like you, it's a tell to me that the folks at the Intelligence Committee are willing to give us so much on the statutory reauthorization but then at the same time, they're willing to give us nothing to bring 12333 into the scope of our reforms. And it's because they want a regime to exist outside the scope of those reforms. So that's, I, I would yield to the chairman if the chairman has any perspective on how these things we're doing now will interface with that executive order and how the Judiciary Committee ought to think about those things. Uh, I would just say, that like the sponsor of the amendment, I have concerns, I think most members do. But I do think the product we are putting together that we have started with and the amendments that we anticipate being offered from both sides of the aisle, um, not all, but most uh, are going to even improve that product. Um, and then I think we have to think in a political dynamic. We know that the Intel Committee is marking up something different tomorrow and that there will be a vote on the, for the full House uh, next week. Um, so we think this, in consultation with the ranking member and members from both sides and the working group and everything else, we think this is the, the best product and the best way that we can do the most to protect the Fourth Amendment and other concerns for Americans' liberty. No, I, I agree, Mr. Chairman. I think you've, you've endeavored upon Yeoman's work here, but I don't want to be back at this committee a year from now, 18 months from now, where we've enacted our reforms and we've got some inspector general sitting before us telling us that 
that the executive order provided all these avenues for the exact same abuses and the exact same conduct. Because I think what troubles us all in a bipartisan way is when you see the activities of the FBI and others exceed the scope of the law. Would and the if gentleman yield? Certainly, I'd yield to the ranking member. I, I'd simply point out that uh, to the extent an executive order 12 triple three or any other um, goes against the legislation that we pass, is it must yield to the legislation. So right, no, I agree with that, which is why I, I wanted to take the time to really get from Ms. Jayapal an understanding of how those things weave together. And it sounds like the amendment sponsor is saying this doesn't, this wouldn't provide a direct conflict with 12 triple three. Would, would the gentleman yield? Certainly. Um, this particular amendment does not touch 12 triple three. That does not mean, as I said, that I don't share your concerns mm -hmm. about 12 triple three. I think there will be other amendments that will touch uh, different pieces. Um, I don't think that there's a perfect solution in this. I think that what we are doing today is recognizing this will be an enormous step forward. And given everything that you've mentioned about the dynamics of, of the intelligence community and our belief that we need to have strong tools, of course, to protect intelligence, but they cannot fundamentally undermine the civil liberties and privacy of Americans. And I think that is the, uh, that is the place that we are in. We're, we're literally, I think, making steps that I don't know about you, but maybe five years ago, I didn't really believe were necessarily possible, but here we are. And um, I think we just need to be extremely vigilant, recognize that, you know, in our initial offerings, I think you and I probably agreed on 12 triple three and where we should go with that. Um, but I think this is a big step forward. The amendment on its own, I think is an important piece just to continue to close some of those ways in which we think that, um, people might try to evade what, what, what our intent is to protect the privacy and civil liberties of Americans. Th thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The ranking members recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I rise in support of the amendment. I commend Ms. Jayapal for it. And I think a very simple explanation of it is, is very simple. By prohibiting, when a, by prohibiting targeting when a significant purpose of the collection is to target a U.S. person, not just when the purpose is to target a U.S. person, the amendment would prevent intelligence agencies from skirting constitutional protections when they seek to gather intelligence about Americans. They could no longer say, well, you know, the entire purpose was not uh, the U.S. citizen. The US, uh, citizen. Uh, this would say if it's a significant purpose, uh, it, it, it's not permissible. Uh, I support the amendment to limit the ability of the, uh, of the intelligence com community to improperly collect information about U.S. Purpose, uh, persons. I commend Ms. Jayapal for her dedication and hard work on this issue. I think the amendment strengthens the bill and improves it, and I urge its adoption. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I agree with the ranking member. Anyone else seek the sponsor of the bill? Mr. <laughs> Mr. Biggs is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the Jayapal amendment. I think um, even, even uh, a district court uh, dealing with uh, the U.S. versus Hasbajrami case uh, talked about in dicta, talked about the, this parallelism that the, the FBI and other agencies were using to eff effectively conduct backdoor searches, and this uh, significantly closes that loophole. So I think it's a, it's a really good move, and I'm also grateful to both uh, both my colleagues, Mr. Gates and Ms. Jayapal, for bringing up uh, EO 12 triple three. I mean, that's something that that I think we share a common view of, but I'm, we'll get more discussion about that as we go along. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, the, you know, the gentleman from Kentucky is recognized on the amendment. I just want to briefly speak in favor of the amendment. I think it's very important. Um, this is a huge gaping loophole in the law that, that's being closed by this amendment. I think it's very important. We've got to be careful that when we do um, you know, revise 702, and then when we put the protections in, that we don't leave, leave gaping loopholes. And so I appreciate Ms. Jayapal's work on this and Ms. Lofgren's work on it, and um, I support it because without this amendment, uh, I think a lot of the other reforms in this bill could be for naught. And um, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman recognized, uh, the gentleman from Texas recognized. I just want to add uh, my uh, support for the amendment uh, and uh, 
associate myself with the remarks of my colleagues here about why it's important. Um, that's already been stipulated. I do think on 12, uh, triple three, I think um, I, I don't take full comfort in the uh, yielding to legislative protection, um, especially in the world in which if the executive branch is effectively saying they've got the, with, with some actually basis, saying they've got the constitutional authority to do what they need to do with respect to going after foreign actors and collect that information, um, <clears throat> we've got to be mindful about how we're fully structuring this to protect against abuses there, because I fully believe if we let this expire, uh, or if 702 never existed, the executive branch is going to continue to go collect that information anyway, and they'll backdoor whatever the hell they want. So whatever we can do here, I think it's hard to go far enough to be able to say that we're going to do what we need to do to protect individual liberty and any of the backdoors. So with respect to this, I support the amendment. I want us to continue to have this dialogue. Um, Would the gentleman yield? Well, it's the chair. Well, yes, it's my time. Yeah, I yield. I just want to say I find it uh, immensely encouraging that uh, you and I found something we agree on. <laughs> well, we'll try not to make it happen too often. <laughs> I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment from the gentlelady from Washington. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The <coughs> amendment is adopted. Uh, who seeks recognition? The gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 6570 offered by Mr. Klein. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. A point of order is reserved by the sponsor of the legislation. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I offer this amendment to uh, ensure that when a judge decides whether to permit surveillance under FISA, it is critical that that, that judge have detailed and accurate information about the case. Sadly, we've learned over the years that government lawyers frequently fail to include important and relevant information in FISA applications, often leaving out facts that could lead a judge to ask more challenging questions or to decline to authorize surveillance. This amendment requires a set of procedures to be in place to ensure that applications for a court order under FISA are accurate and complete, and that they include information that could call into question the accuracy or reliability of assessments or reporting in an application, including details about an applicant's prior or existing relationship with a target. This amendment also requires annual auditing and compliance mechanisms to ensure accurate procedures are effective. Importantly, any federal officer applying for a court order under FISA must describe the accuracy procedures used and certify that he or she has collected and reviewed supporting documentation for each assertion in the application. Judges, in turn, will only be allowed to enter an order under FISA if they find that the accuracy procedures described in the application are adequate. This amendment would, in essence, bolster the affidavit that Section 6 of the bill requires and is additional protection for the American people. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona withdraws his point of order, and the gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized to speak on the amendment. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much to Congressman Klein for introducing this amendment. I, too, have been working on the same thing. Um, I think it's so important that before um, anything moves forward that we have accurate information. I do want to add this amendment would also require that exculpatory information be provided to the judge and to the other side. Yep. And um, currently that is not happening. And so that's just another reason why this amendment is so important. And I commend the amendment to the committee. <laughs> Gentlelady lady yields back. Um, I, too, support the, the, the amendment and uh, encourage the adoption. Chair recognizes the ranking member. Uh, I support the adoption. I think it's an excellent amendment. I yield back. Question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted and will become part of the bill. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California? Yes. Gentleman from California to offer an, uh, for an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> uh, 
Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6570. Objection will be considered as read. Um, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California to uh, speak on the amendment. Point of order reserved by the gentleman from Florida. Thank you. The gentleman from California is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Thank you. first, I welcome the opportunity um, to have this conversation about the balance of civil liberties and national security. And I would first say that the Biden administration, more than any administration, has addressed many of these issues with executive actions that they've taken to reduce the number of U.S. person inquiries that have been made to make sure that they're more targeted and, and more precise and, and aimed at legitimate national security problems. Since they've done that, the FBI has reduced its overall querying by 94% of U.S. persons. And I, I support codifying and, and putting into law anything that does that. However, I also, and by the way, my amendment codifies um, executive order principles around privacy that the administration has espoused. I want to speak, though, to a larger concern that I have with the bill. And I, I first want to speak personally, because there's nobody on this committee who has been a bigger victim of the weaponization of the intelligence community than me. I have had my cell phone data subpoenaed and procured by the Trump administration. In 2012, in a district with 40% Asian Americans, an Asian volunteer helped my campaign. I was later asked by the FBI to help that, to help the FBI understand who this person was. I did, I cooperated. They took care of a threat I was not aware of. And then years later, under the Trump administration, an IC official leaked my cooperation, perverted it, suggested wrongdoing. Fox News ran with it. A member of this committee filed an ethics report against me. Thousands of death threats have come at me. Hundreds of thousands of dollars from me have been spent to protect myself and my family. I was removed from the Intelligence Committee by Speaker McCarthy to only learn a few months ago that the Ethics Committee took years for that complaint to find that what was alleged was not substantiated and the complaint was closed and no wrongdoing was found. So I know what it's like when an administration misuses the intelligence community to go after an enemy. I know it. I felt it. I paid the price for it. But this bill to take away intelligence community's ability to see threats from foreign terrorists and who they may be communicating with is going to leave us in the blind and take us back to the days before September 11. And I would suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, it's not an accident that we have not had a serious terrorist attack in America since September 11. Our post-September 11 responses, we got it wrong in many ways. We got it wrong around Islamophobia, we probably haven't been perfect in the way we get people on airplanes, but what we have done to survey terrorists overseas, surveil terrorists overseas, has been largely successful. And now we are saying that if a foreign terrorist references a U.S. person, that the only way for the FBI to protect us here at home is to go and get a warrant to learn more about the U.S. person that is referenced on data that has already been lawfully collected, they're not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to establish probable cause if all they have is a name, a selector, an email, a phone number. And the courts have told us it'll take them four months to do it. So we are putting ourselves in a position where foreign terrorists could be talking about a U.S. person. We could have already lawfully collected information from other foreign terrorists that reference this U.S. person 
And we are telling the FBI, you cannot search that database to see if there's any pattern of that U.S. person talking to a foreign terrorist. Maybe the U.S. person is just innocently ordering a pizza from a suspected foreign terrorist, or that U.S. person is constantly in contact with that person and is going to blow up a church. We are now taking away the FBI's ability to do that. That makes me very nervous, and it takes us back to a pre-September 11 environment, and I think we can do this in a better way that protects civil liberties without leaving us so vulnerable to a catastrophic terrorist attack. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I support the amendment and accept the amendment and, and uh, encourage the people to adopt the amendment. Um, I, I would refute um, and take issue with the, the, the conjecture with regard to the, to the overall underlying bill, and I appreciate your perspective. I disagree with it. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've put, if there is an exigent circumstance, we put an exigent circumstance exception right into this bill that is consistent. Uh, if there's a cybersecurity issue, we've put that into the bill as an exception as well, but um, it's hard to it's hard to justify status quo anti this bill. I mean, with it, without this bill, knowing that the, the number of improper queries that have been performed by the FBI, for instance, in last year, over a quarter of a million. And uh, with that, I'll yield to the gentleman from Florida. Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, in accepting this amendment, has the bill sponsor, I, I would point your attention to page three uh, subsection K, when the amendment references protecting the integrity of elections and political processes, like what, what's a political process that would be appropriately protected by this amendment? Does that, does that give you any concern? I, I took political process to be this type of political process, Congress. But can you not see how someone utilizing that authority might see it differently? I can. Does that concern you? Believe me, it all concerns me, Mr. Well, and perhaps I'll ask the sponsor of the amendment. Mr. Swalwa, what, how should I understand the, the phrase political processes in line 21 of page three of the amendment? This is directly from the, exec, the executive order from the White House that has seen. Is that 12 triple three, that executive order? Or a different one? Different no. one. <coughs> different a different one. one. And by protecting the integrity of elections and, and political processes, it's exactly what Mr. Big said. This one. Ours. Okay. I yield back. I yield back. Uh, <laughs> seek to, uh, there was still time left for the gentleman. The gentleman from Arizona yield back. Gentleman, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, is recognized. Speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to yield a some time to my colleague from California, uh, Mr. Swalwell, for the purpose of really addressing the comments just made with, you mentioned the possibility of four months to get a warrant. Uh, you also mentioned the administration's efforts to uh, better secure our civil liberties. I would ask you to, with some comments here, I'm gonna yield you some time to explain a little bit more uh, uh, on your perspective on that. I agree with you. Uh, we haven't had a terrorist attack in this country in a long time. Given the nature of the world right now, heightened state of alert, so to speak, please explain to me, warrant civil liberties and the status of the world situation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Correa. I, I guess this bill ignores the extensive remedial measures that the FBI and the Department of Justice has taken in response to FBI's compliance failures. In 2021 and 2022, the FBI and DOJ implemented a battery of policy changes. Among other things, FBI systems now require personnel to opt in to 702 data before a query of the database can be conducted, which reduces the risk of inadvertent queries to the point that Mr. Biggs made uh, of abuses in the past. FBI personnel must also obtain attorney approval to conduct sensitive
queries. So the most sensitive to, I think, the point Mr. Gates was making would be of elected officials or people in journalism or of a, a celebrity status who speak on politics. It now requires leveling up uh, the approvals that have to be given before uh, that can happen. And the most sensitive, like elected officials, require the personal prior approval of the deputy FBI director. FBI personnel must also take required training or risk losing access to 702. Since those reforms have been put in place, FBI US person queries dropped by 94%, and the query compliance rate rose to 98%. So seeking to extend this positive trend, the FBI announced a three-strike policy uh, with escalating consequences for negligent FISA violations. And, and so I, I just want to address what Mr. Biggs said earlier. Mr. Biggs, um, you, you mentioned the exigencies that exist for cyber or terrorism, and, and I acknowledge those, but my concern, and, and I, I hope the chair is listening to this as well, is if you have a foreign terrorist who you've already lawfully been able to target with 702, and that foreign terrorist is talking about a U.S. person, but not talking about that U.S. person with a specific terrorism plot, but just saying, we've been in contact with John Smith, or in their emails, you see John Smith is CC'd. That probably doesn't qualify under the exigency that you have established in this bill. But if John Smith goes and blows up a church, I think all of our constituents are going to say, why the hell didn't you go back and see if you already had lawfully collected information about John Smith to stitch together how many times John Smith was talking to overseas terrorists. And so if you have an exigency that allows them to do that, I welcome that. I'm just saying that that is the blind spot that we're, we're kind of creating right here. I'll yield back to Mr. Cray, and I think Mr. Biggs may uh, have a response. Yeah, th th thanks, thanks for double, the double yield. I w I, the, in the scenario that you posit, you're using about language. Uh, of Section 702, which is already extremely problematic. And that is uh, one thing that all of us have been concerned about is because um, in the court cases that you can review on this, you'll see that the FBI has actually abused the about language. The Inspector General specifically pointed out that some of these queries that were done illegitimately were using the about section of the statute. And so that's why um, I, I'm not necessarily accepting your, your hypothesis because it, it, that, that section has been widely abused by, by the FBI and other, uh, the other alphabet soup. Mr. Carrera, do you yield back? Yes, Gentleman yields back. Pardon me? Oh, Mr. Van Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Chairman. You know, I, I do understand the gentleman uh, from California, and I understand his concerns. And this is the difficult issue with all this. But, it you know, we are going to accept that, if you accept, and I don't, but if you accept that things are so much better now and we're going to be okay because of what folks are doing because of one particular order by the president, whatever, no, we have to be really careful here. We have to understand that this is about Fourth Amendment rights. It's about First Amendment rights. That's why this bill is necessary. None of us, none of us want to see terrorists uh, f have free reign. None of us don't want to investigate terrorists and, quite frankly, the evil people that exist around the world and in our country who want to do great harm to our republic and our democracy. But the bottom line here is, you know, almost the only thing worse than the terrorists themselves are when our regulatory agencies terrorize free, independent people to actually be able to speak and do what they want. Um, I do not support the amendment. I think that this bill has been a labor of love. It's taken a good deal of time. It addresses the serious issues and lets individuals move forward when they really need to. When I say individuals, I mean those in regulatory agencies to move forward. It allows the judges to move forward. At the same time, puts a check on what is done. And to use the statistic that we're 96% better, well, we're 96% better over millions of mishaps 
inappropriate uh, intrusions into people's personal lives, intrusion into their freedom. And I'm gonna probably say this another time today, but Ben Franklin got it right. Those that would give up freedom for safety deserve neither. This bill without this amendment and with um, Mr. Klein's amendment uh, does just that. I yield back. The gentleman yield. The gentleman yield. I yield to the chair. Thank you. Just because I know it, it, it's obvious to every member, but for the record, we are talking about a statute that cannot, by definition, preempt the Constitution. And the gentleman referred to the Fourth Amendment, so I'll take a moment and read it. The right of the people, being us, to be secure in their homes, persons, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall be issued but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. And the reason I read that is there's no question we're talking about people's effects. And when the Constitution was written, they assumed that there would be no searches without a warrant. And so the very discussion that we don't need a warrant, but that we will in fact search a person's based on our termination, our determination of reasonable being the administration and without warrant was inherently from day one in violation of the Constitution. And so as much as I normally try to agree with my gentleman from California, I think we have to go back to the Constitution, which assumes a warrant except in exigent circumstances, which is not called out in the Constitution, but has been affirmed by the, by the court. And that is what I believe that all of us, whether we support this particular amendment or not, but to support the underlying bill, are here to discuss today. The fact that the administration says that for a time, by policy, they will make changes, can give no one an assurance that their constitution is being protected by statute if that statute is, in, is not consistent with the Fourth Amendment, which I think we can all agree in this case is unambiguous. And I thank the gentleman so much for yielding. And, and would I, the gentleman from New Jersey yield for the last 30 seconds? I will yield to the gentleman from California. Thank you. I, I hope you still support this amendment because th this amendment is separate from my concern about the warrant requirement. It, it, this amendment simply puts into the bill the Enhancing Safeguards for United States Signals Intelligence Activities, EO14086, which has led to the reduction in uh, queries uh, that have been problematic. So this, and I believe this amendment has been accepted by the majority. And I just wanted to clarify that uh, for you, and I'd yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. The, the ranking member is recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the chairman. I, I want to point out uh, to the gentleman from New Jersey, there obviously is a warrant requirement in the Constitution. The entire purpose of this bill is to flesh out and enforce that warrant requirement in cases in which it isn't properly being enforced now. Uh, in Section 702 and various, some other things. That's the entire purpose of the bill, is to flesh out and to, and to more uh, robustly enforce the warrant requirement where it isn't being enforced. As to the amendment, I want to thank Congressman Swalwell for his thoughtful amendment that would codify the scope of surveillance in order to more robustly protect Americans' communications. The amendment codifies the approach adopted by President Biden in Executive Order 14086. The amendment would strengthen the President's actions by making the objective statutory law. The objectives directly encompass information related to transnational risks to public health, humanitarian threats, hostage taking, protection against espionage, cybersecurity threats, threats to U.S. personnel, and a number of other vital categories of intelligence. My understanding is that there is a strong consensus for this amendment in both the executive and legislative branches. I also, I also express my support for this measure, and I want to thank Mrs. Swalwell for the amendment, and with that, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield no, to I'll, the gentlelady from Wyoming? Sure, I'll, I'll yield to the gentlelady. I, I, I yield back, and I yield to the gentlelady from Wyoming. 
Just very quickly, I am opposed to uh, this amendment on page two. You can see that they're attempting to insert as uh, uh, describing transnational threats as being uh, climate and other ecological change. I don't believe that that has any, uh, that that is appropriate to include that kind of information in this bill. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with what we're discussing. I am opposed to the amendment as they try to uh, uh, expand their climate change hysteria into this area as well. So I'm opposed to this amendment. The young lady yields back. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what, uh, the gentleman from Colorado is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to um, uh, actually engage in a colloquy with you if you're interested, but um, the Constitution, the Fourth Amendment, does not require a warrant for the federal government to access information that it has already legally collected. And I, I, let, me, let me clarify, if I may. If, if uh, uh, a police agency, federal, state, local, uh, conducts a legal search warrant, and uh, in the process of looking for um, let's say child pornography, they come across a bag of cocaine. They can take that bag of cocaine and charge the defendant even though there wasn't a warrant, even though there wasn't anything in the warrant for that because it was in plain view. So they didn't get a warrant for the bag of cocaine. If they conduct a search warrant for child pornography and they find um, evidence of a crime for someone that is not uh, covered by that search warrant, they can use that evidence against another person, and that person doesn't even have a standing uh, to, to uh, uh, challenge the legality of the original search warrant. The information in this situation has been collected legally. It has been collected by the federal government um, because it is the property of foreign entities. Could be. Uh, the, the Chinese government, it could be uh, Hamas, it could be various others. And in that information, there is the name of a U.S. citizen or an email from a U.S. citizen. So the information was collected legally, and now the government is going in to uh, search uh, a particular U.S. citizen's name. The warrant requirement is something that we, Congress, is placing on the federal government over and above what the Constitution requires. I believe it's appropriate. I'm not suggesting it's not appropriate. It is absolutely appropriate that we give additional protections to Americans in this very sensitive area, but it is not something that the Constitution requires, and that's what the courts have found, and that's why it's so important that we come together and decide where the line is between national security and protecting the privacy of American citizens. And I yield to the- The gentleman would, would yield. I couldn't agree with you more that drawing that line is our responsibility and uh, in spite of the court's determinations and administration's determination, it falls to this committee to draw the line. I might try to put as a question, uh, if our founding fathers saw a ship coming into port and it opened, it took the bag of mail coming from, uh, from Britain or some other country, and it opened it up and it looked at every addressee it may or may not violate their constitutional right to privacy because it's not yet their things. But if it opened every letter and read every letter and said, well, it's a foreigner's piece of mail until it's delivered to the American, and then said, but it's already in our database, so now we have what we need against the American, every American would have been outraged that his prospective mail was opened and read on the guise that it came from a foreign source. And that's what we are here to decide is what from a foreign source collection without a separate warrant can be looked at and used. So I agree with the gentleman that that which is in open databases, that which is collected from open source is certainly available to the domestic agencies without a warrant. But that which would require a warrant were it an American, per, a US person, cannot simply say, well, we got the U.S. person because we were looking at a foreign person. That would not qualify. And I think if we go back to original intent, they would not have approved every piece of mail coming into port being opened based on it belonging to a foreigner 
and then using that database against American citizens. So hopefully that, that draws that middle ground that we are seeking here today. Jim and you, or I reclaim my time. Um, I agree with the gentleman, and, and all I'm saying is that we are trying to find that sweet spot that um, uh, protects Americans' rights over and above the constitutional protection that they already have, um, and uh, at the same time does not put Americans at risk for foreign terrorists, spies, uh, hackers, and, and others. And so uh, while the Constitution um, is absolutely clear as to Americans' property in America, as that ship came into America, it's absolutely clear what protections Americans have uh, without the government agency getting a warrant, um, we are going over and above that. Absolutely appropriate that we do so, but I want to make sure that it is not, uh, we're not trying to find the area um, uh, that is, uh, we're, we're not trying to interpret the Fourth Amendment in, in a way that is different than what the courts have already interpreted as. And I, uh, unless the gentleman wants uh, to. just briefly say that I, I, I do differ from the gentleman in a small way. I don't believe that we are constrained by the court's decisions based on laws we passed. Constitutional interpretation, yes, but laws we've passed, we are open to change and change them is often in contradiction or response to uh, a court's decision. In other words, push back on the court's decision by changing the law to change the outcome. And that's also what we're considering doing here today. I think we are. We're, we're considering adding additional protections for Americans, which is appropriate. But it, it goes beyond just the scope of the Fourth Amendment. And, and I yield back. I, it clearly does. And with that, I believe the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff, would seek recognition. Uh, move, to, you're, move to strike the last word. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'll be brief. I rise in support of the Swalwell Amendment, um, which codifies uh, uh, procedures and protections put in place by the administration to address uh, issues that have been raised by the FISA court. Uh, I think uh, we can all, I hope, recognize that 702 has been an incredibly important tool uh, to protect Americans, to protect the country. Um, I think we should also recognize that there have been a lot of problems with the use of 702 that have been revealed by FISA court judges, um, most of them uh, systemic uh, and perhaps unintended errors, uh, others intentional, uh, all are meriting or addressing in this bill. And the challenge, I think, for all of us is how do we address the problems identified by the FISA court at the same time not imposing requirements that would essentially uh, negate the effectiveness of 702 in protecting the country? Uh, I think Mr. Swalwell's amendment uh, advances our security without uh, hampering legitimate use of 702 to protect the country. I think it strikes the right balance. Uh, there are other provisions of the bill that I am concerned about that may um, uh, effectively negate uh, law enforcement's legitimate use to protect the country uh, of 702. But uh, I think Mr. Swalwell's amendment uh, is a improvement to the bill and uh, strikes the right balance and I urge its support. Gentleman yields back. Uh, let's see, the gentleman from North Carolina is recognized yet. I thank the chairman um, and I will say, begin this and I hope I'm not about to embarrass myself by in a momentary inattention. I had to step out for a bit and by the time I got back, this was well underway and so I just started reading and as I've been listening to the debate, and, and then uh, Mr. Biggs walked over and indicated that he had said he thought this might be acceptable. I, if I, if, first of all, if I could just lead, yield to the gentleman, Mr. Swalwell, is this, we're talking about the amendment that modifies the definition of what foreign intelligence information is? Is that right, sir? This codifies the administration's guidance on the collection of signals intelligence. Is it the one that modifies uh, Section 1801E that defines foreign intelligence information? That's okay. correct. It thank, is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, th then, I, first of all, I'm very pleased with the general tenor of this hearing and the, and the bipartisanship on this important reform measure. But as to this, I'm, I find myself stunned that it is that folks are talking about this as it might be acceptable. It takes. Foreign intelligence information under the statute as it now exists is defined 
as five categories, actual and potential attack or other grave hostile acts of a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. Two, sabotage international terrorism or the international proliferation of weapons of mass destruction by a foreign power or agent of a foreign power. Three, clandestine acti intelligence activities by an intelligence service or network of a foreign power or by an agent of, for of a foreign power. And then there are two more. This comes under subparagraph two. The national defense uh, um, information uh, that relates to, excuse me, information with respect to a foreign power or foreign territory that relates to and if concerning a United States person is necessary to the national defense or security of the United States or be the conduct of foreign affairs of the United States. Those five categories. This proposes, as I understand it, to introduce 11 new categories, to triple, at least by cat numerical categories, what is defined as foreign intelligence information. It also... Whereas most of those things, all of those things, seem to involve, if you talk about conduct of foreign affairs or national defense or the security of the United States, those are pretty broad categories and might not, but everything else above that involved acts of a foreign power, and most of them are really severe military kind of potential violent attacks. This expansion by adding, by, by adding, uh, twice as many categories as exist to the bill on the fly has all sorts of stuff in here that is pure political in its nature, some of which you could be seen that way. For example, protecting the integrity of elections and political processes, government property. If, there's, if, if somebody uh, committed some vandalism for um, involving some government property in Dubai, it's, it's, an in, it's suddenly in the, in the definition of foreign intelligence information. There's almost nothing you couldn't pack into these new expanded definitions. The whole problem that we face that where FISA seems to be a consensus in this committee that FISA requires serious reform is it's been too broad, too uh, carelessly administered, and the government is doing things to then say, we're gonna expand <laughs> the definition of the very notion of foreign intelligence information massively that is, I, I say that I just wanted to take us through it sort of forensically, and I hope I've gotten, maybe I should still save since there's a little bit more time available. A couple other things. Protecting against illicit finance. Gosh, illicit finance could involve some things that get in the category of foreign intelligence information, but it's grossly overbroad. Uh, it, does that mean every criminal conspiracy involving money laundering in the world is suddenly is opened up into foreign intelligence information? We've just imported that into the definition of foreign intelligence information. If you get into the parts of the ones on climate change, transnational threats that impact global security, including climate and other ecological change. We're making everything involving that foreign intelligence information? That's the proposal, and somebody suggested that could be acceptable. With all due respect to my, my friend and colleague from Arizona, this one's, in, I, I won't say the word, this one doesn't make sense to me. And I, I may have, if I've missed something about what's happened here, then I regret uh, taking the committee's time. But it seems to me to be a massive change in the expansion of the whole categorical application of what foreign intelligence information is in an environment where we've recognized it's being abused as it is. I yield. Mr. Chairman. Hey, yeah, who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Yes, the gentleman from Texas. So I want to associate uh, myself. You moved to strike the last word. Yeah, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I want to associate myself with the concerns raised by the gentleman from North Carolina. Um, we are here in a unusual display of bipartisanship, designed, I believe, to protect the civil liberties of the United States of the United States citizens, and importantly. That means constraining and limiting the breadth and depth of how FISA can be used and then turned around and targeted to the American people. My friend from North Carolina raises significant issues that are raising this. One he did not mention when he added in, including climate and other ecological change, and putting aside some political differences across the aisles about our concerns about relative topics here, this is a massive expansion of the 
focus of what is supposed to be directed towards foreign intelligence that is designed to protect the United States from foreign threat, immediate threat, danger directly to the, to the American people in the form of a foreign actor, a foreign country, um, you know, engaging with weapons of mass destruction or direct threats, but not what is now opening this up to political weaponization. And it, I would note in here, in addition to the climate and other ecological change, public health risks and wow. public health risks. Now, we just went through an extraordinary circumstance in this country over the last three or four years um, and in which there are questions raised about the powers of the World Health Organization and others. And we want to say that somehow, somehow public health risks... Would the gentleman it, yield to that point? I'll, I'll yield because I Thank do you. want I, I, and I do want to yield time to respond to yep. the gentleman from North Carolina yep. and me about the concerns here. Sure. On the public health risk, I think you would agree because there were legitimate concerns about whether COVID was a leak from the sure. Wuhan lab. Well, the only way, the most effective way to determine that would be if our intelligence community had authorities to direct surveillance at foreign nationals, at Chinese or anyone else that they would right. communicate with. So this is articulating that public health is a, a reason that we would want to aim our surveillance capabilities uh, overseas, and I deal back. Well, and, and I appreciate that, and I, I, I appreciate what you're trying to argue there. My concern is, right, we already have language in the existing statutes, right, where it's actual or potential attack or other grave hostile acts of a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. If, if, the, if our federal government currently believed that they were going to carry out an attack, a biological attack or some other action, I, I, be, I believe it's there in the statute because, but it, but it's important when we start line iteming these kinds of things, we are now expanding the zone of foreign intelligence in ways that is deeply concerning, um, and and I understand that that the language currently might still capture what the gentleman's saying, so that might seem contradictory, but by by putting this language in this list of all of these things, public health, climate, and other ecological change. I believe that we are massively expanding the scope of foreign intelligence away from the direct imminent harm attack uh, idea of the limitation. In other words, we have 230 whatever thousand or 250,000, whatever the number is, targets, right? When we're focusing on foreign targets, whatever the numbers are, we have some limited number, right? And if we, if we start expanding the zone on the definition, we're gonna have a million targets or two million targets, five million targets. And then that's going to be collecting more information, collecting more information on Americans in the conversation, in the exchange of communications between Americans and those individuals. And I think the whole point here of this legislation is to limit and limit the, the, the breadth of FISA and to limit its possible direction on American citizens. If we want to have a different debate on the definitions of FISA, uh, that might be meritorious. But right now, at this point, I cannot imagine expanding that. I'd yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman from Texas. And the, to, to that, I would add, I, I think, I, and I've, again, I've made, I missed the very first part of this discussion, including the sponsor's con, uh, discussion. But what I can't understand is what is currently not in the definition of foreign intelligence information that has, in some identifiable way, limited the ability of the intelligence community to protect the United States? I, I, so, like what, what was just said about COVID, if it, if it were a, a, a something designed to be a weapon by the Chinese Communist government, it's clearly within the existing definition. If it's if it's just something, everything piece involving uh, research around the world about coronaviruses, that, that's too broad, and and it presents hazard simply by its breadth. I yield. Uh, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. Is, is recognized. Did you have from California, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, to add. I, I, it's true that a 702 inquiry on, on a foreign person um, may put some of my records in the legal possession of the FBI, but that doesn't give them the right to then rifle through those records without a warrant, in, in my opinion. I agree with Mr. Swalwell that there's, there's no question that the FBI has been on its best behavior since its abuses came to light, but I'm deeply skeptical that this is in response to any directives or internal reforms or, 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 or sudden reformation 
uh, within the agency. It's because they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. And we need to remember that their abuses didn't come to light easily. It required multiple ge inspector general reports, years of congressional hearings. So of course they're on their best behavior because they're under intense public scrutiny. The question before us is what happens when that intense public scrutiny fades away to other issues? Having seriously abused this authority once, there's every reason to believe they'll do so again. Uh, that's why we're adopting this law, to restore a bedrock constitutional principle. We created government to protect us from those who would do us harm. But the founders also recognized that in doing that, we had to protect ourselves against abuses by that government. That's why we have a Bill of Rights, and that's why we have a Fourth Amendment. And that Fourth Amendment says, if you want to go through my stuff, including my phone records, you've got to get a warrant. That, that standard served us well, and that this law will put it back in place in, in this era of digital communications. I'm concerned that, that this amendment opens up so many potential loopholes as to invite a return to these abuses. I just uh, posed this question before. Imagine how, how safe we would be if we stationed a soldier in every home. But we have a third amendment to protect us from this injustice, just as we have a fourth amendment to protect us from warrantless Would the gentleman yield? I'll yield to the gentleman from California. The gentleman brings up a very good point, and I want to thank the gentleman from North Carolina and the gentlelady from Wyoming for what they've done to bring this to light. I do think that there's a, a legitimate reason for this committee at some future time to look at a, the executive orders implementing FISA, which is what we're really doing, is codifying a presidential interpretation of the law and then expanding that definition to match his, his or her interpretation. And I think the gentleman's making a very good point, which is there is no limit to what our agencies, foreign agencies, can spy. They can spy anywhere, anytime, on anything. We are only dealing with the look back to American citizens as we speak. And so I, I think the idea that, that we would willfully expand to a, a new definition uh, at this point would seem to be an expansion that has no stated purpose. If the administration believes that, that these are fair implementations of the original language, we need not codify. And if at some future time, and that future time could be sooner rather than later, we evaluated it, I'm sure the administration would happily accept an expansion of their definition. And so I thank the gentleman from California because if not for this dialogue, I too was willing to say, oh, we're only codifying uh, the, the reality of an, uh, of an executive order. I now see that that is a likely expansion beyond the scope of the original language and not appropriate to uh, reining in uh, known abuses. So. Uh, Again, I want to thank the gentleman from North Carolina and also the gentlelady from Wyoming. And I yield to the gentleman from New Jersey. I just want to associate myself uh, with the gentleman from California, the gentleman from Texas, and the gentleman from North, North Carolina. Again, let's be clear. This amendment brings us back a step. We're doing legislation at a bipartisan level to ensure the safety of Americans' freedom, their First Amendment rights, their Fourth Amendment rights. And this legislation, by broadening the scope, um, actually makes it worse. It would be ironic, and quite frankly, in plain language, would be horrible if we did an amendment to legislation that brings us to a better place that actually undoes the per undoes the purpose of the legislation. I yield back. Yield back. Gentleman from California yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Florida. No one seeks recognition. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The, uh, who seeks Recorded right? vote, please. Recorded vote being requested by the, the sponsor of the amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Buck votes no. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Sparts. 
Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. No. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong. <coughs> Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden. Who's up next, Mr. Barr? Mr. Van Drew. No. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. No. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. No. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Swallow votes aye. Mr. Liu. Ms. Chayapal. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagus. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey? No. Mr. Ivey votes no. Ms. Ballant? Ms. Ballant votes aye. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Anyone? We're good, aren't you? Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are nine ayes and 20 noes. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado for an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 6570. Not objection to the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I raise a uh, reserve a point of order. Uh, the amendment will be. Uh, uh, Considered as read, the point of order reserved by the gentleman from California. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized to speak on his amendment. I thank the chair and, and Mr. Chairman. First, I want to thank you and uh, Mr. Biggs and uh, the others who have worked on this. I think it is absolutely essential uh, that we uh, find ways to balance the interests of protecting Americans from threats as well as protecting Americans' constitutional <sighs> rights the, uh, and, an, and an expansion of those constitutional rights is appropriate. I, as most members of this committee did uh, five years ago, I voted against a clean reauthorization of FISA. I thought that uh, we needed reforms. This bill addresses many important reforms. I believe in some respects uh, goes too far, and I would like to uh, offer a few amendments uh, starting with this one. This amendment, um, I think I can best point out the, the need for this amendment by uh, uh, describing a, uh, a situation, a hypothetical situation. Uh, a suspected member of the Sinaloa cartel crosses the southern border, claims asylum, and is released into the country. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is monitoring the cartel's communications and catches them communicating with the asylee. Page 15, line 1 through page 16, line 15 of this bill requires that the FISA court appoint, requires that the FISA court appoint an amicus to oversee the application process in favor of the subject of surveillance, a privilege that is not granted to American citizens when law enforcement is seeking a warrant domestically within the U.S. court system. The amicus delays the applicant's consideration for a year, and the asylee assists his fellow criminals in getting thousands of pounds of fentanyl over the southern border killing untold members, numbers of American children. This is a real national security threat that 702, Section 702 allowed federal law enforcement to stop, but this bill would have inadvertently, and I am not questioning the intentions of my uh, friends on this committee, but inadvertently assisted the cartel member in continuing the drug trade. I know that my colleagues have good intentions with the uh, amici provision of this bill, but its side effects will cause real harm to American citizens. We have to ask ourselves if we want to support Americans with real reform or embolden our enemies with a one-size-fits-all language. Over the past three years, the crisis at the American southern border has escalated into a catastrophe. Our nation's security, the health and safety of its youth, our culture, and our very future are at stake. 
Throughout the, uh, uh, the proposed legislation requires the appointment of an amicus curiae for all FISA court proceedings. This sounds like a great victory for transparency until you realize appointing amici in all FISA court proceedings includes those that are meant to target human trafficking, cartels, and foreign terrorists. This bill states that an amicus must be appointed where there are sensitive investigatory matters at hand, when new and existing programs and technologies request approval, when programmatic surveillance is reauthorized and other uh, such exceptions. These amicus requirements extend to non-citizens. They cover applications by the FBI, CIA, and DOJ when seeking to root out terrorists, coyotes, and drug traffickers. I propose amending the first sentence, giving the court discretion by changing shall to may. After all, the court knows best when a helping hand is necessary. I'm also offering to amend the language of this proposed bill to make it explicitly clear that amici are only allowed when a U.S. citizen is targeted in some way by the FISA application. It would add the language targets a U.S. person seven times to ensure that the courts only appoint amici to cases that involve the targeting of Americans. Uh, I ask my, uh, incur uh, and encourage my colleagues to support my amendment, and I yield back. When he yields back, the gentleman from California withdraws his uh, point of order. I withdraw my point of order. And the gentleman from uh, New York, the ranking member, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I must oppose this amendment. This language further reduces the amicus curiae's ability to engage in these proceedings, further limiting the types of cases in which their appointment will be sought. We have, in, in negotiating this bill, we have very carefully considered how these amici should be involved to ensure that civil liberties concerns are fully addressed in these often very secretive proceedings. All this language is carefully crafted to ensure our civil liberties can be represented by amici in a constitutional matter. manner. This limitation goes against our bipartisan agreement in this bill, and I therefore must oppose it and urge my colleagues to oppose it as well. Will the ranking member yield? I'll, I'll yield. Uh, thank you. Um, the ranking member is correct that this uh, perhaps may go against what was agreed upon between the majority and the minority. Um, however, uh, the chairman uh, did agree uh, to support the amendment that I had offered earlier. And then, as you saw, when it came up for a vote, he voted against it. And I would just... Excuse me, I voted for your amendment. No, the chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll be the chairman again sorry, soon, yeah. but <laughs> not right now. Um, and so, Mr. Ranking Member, I, I just want to point out to my colleagues, um, that's who we're doing this deal with, uh, is somebody who would tell you something in private that he's going to support your amendment, and then back off his support uh, publicly. And, and that's why I'm, I'm just concerned in general that their concerns about 702 and privacy are not our legitimate concerns. Would they, the gentleman yield? I'll yield to the gentleman. Yeah, I... I know the gentleman didn't intend to say that, but there was a lively debate, and many of us who were tending to be a yes... He agreed to vote for it. You know, many of us who were tending to be a yes were persuaded to change. Uh, I would hope that, that we all would respect that debate here in the body and additional understanding can cause a change, and we're not, we're not bound by a commitment. <laughs> well, that, that the, a should be bound by commitments. A, that's, how, that's what a commitment is. It, I would suggest that, that the gentleman at least not... Okay, not bound not by commitments. That's the Republican reclaiming, majority. Reclaiming, my, reclaiming my time, I think this discussion is a little fruitless. Um, and I, I just want to reiterate my opposition to this amendment for the reasons I stated, and I yield back. Gentleman, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've reviewed the the amendment of Mr. Mr. Buck, my friend from Colorado. I think his his uh, his motivations and intentions are sincere. Uh, I I do think that it it undermines a bit the joint effort that we've made and the care that we've done to uh, in drafting this piece of legislation. And so I, I regretfully must oppose it, even though I know he's trying to make the bill better. I will say, um, with regard to the point raised by the gentleman from California just moments ago, that uh, I did. You kept I, your commitment. I, I made a commitment. I accepted it publicly. Thank you. Uh, and uh, as the debate went on, I 
grew skeptical, but nonetheless kept the, kept the commitment. I think um, we should not impugn each other. I think we, I think we all need to step back and realize, because I, I think your motivations were sincere <coughs> as well, but I don't think that we should impugn each other. I think we should look, if we really want to try to make the bill better, let's try to make it better. If we, have, uh, if we are comfortable with it, we should, we should go forward with it. I, I know my friend from, from Colorado, um, who wants me to yield to him, which I will yield to him in just a sec, is very sincere in his attempts to make the bill better as well. And with that, I, I'm gonna yield to the gentleman from Colorado. I thank my friend for yielding. Um, I, I'm, I'm missing something here. Uh, there were great discussions between Republicans and Democrats to come up with a compromise for this bill. Um, just like the last amendment, people were swayed by the, uh, the points that were made during the argument. And my point is that there is a hole in this bill. And it may have been a compromise between Republicans and Democrats. We do not want to mandate. And that's what this does, is mandate. And all I'm suggesting is that uh, at any point in time, the court can request that an amicus be appointed in a particular case. At any point in time. But this bill mandates that an amicus be appointed in a particular case. And that's where the problem is. It's, it's being mandated, and that, uh, that mandate uh, goes, uh, or I should say, part of the mandate is a delay in the process. And when we're talking about a Chinese spy, when we're talking about a, a cartel member, when we're talking about dangerous drugs in this country, there should be no delay in the process. And so I oppose the mandate. I absolutely am, am in favor of the Bill. court having the ability to appoint. Um, but we should remember something. Uh, an amicus curiae is a friend of the court, not an enemy of the government, not a representative of a, a particular person, but a friend of the court. And the friend of the court is appointed by the court, and we should give the court discretion uh, to do that. Would the gentleman so yield? I yield General, back to my friend from Mr. Arizona. Mr. Biggs. Would the Mr. gentleman Biggs? yield? I will yield. Gentleman from Arizona yields. Gentleman's recognized, Mr. Nadler. Thank you. I just want to point out that uh, what this bill says is that an amicus shall be appointed unless the court issues a finding that appointment is not appropriate. So that provision is in the bill. That's on page 15 of the bill if anybody's interested in reading it. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Arizona. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks right? Gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, to the ranking member's point, I was going to inquire um, to the gentleman from uh, Colorado with respect to that language on 15 lines 8 and 9, unless the court issues a finding that appointment is not appropriate, is it the gentleman's view, which, which I think does capture the may, so in, in the effort to strike shall and replace it with may, but if you don't do that, it, it seems to me that the, the language that the ranking member just read does take care of that. But I wanted to give the, the gentleman a chance to, to express his view on, on, on how that language would work. And I'm looking specifically, but I believe the bill requires uh, the court to find certain exceptions in order to not appoint. And what I'm doing is just giving the court more discretion beyond those exceptions. And again, we're not talking about a United States citizen. We're talking about someone who comes into this, it, who may it, there may, it may involve others, but um, a, a cartel member, a spy, those folks, those individuals should not receive the protection of uh, an amicus uh, in, in, uh, re, as a requirement for this to go forward. And, that, and that's my only point. That, the go, will the uh, gentleman yield? I, I will yield back to the, the gentleman. Uh, and I will yield to the gentleman. For Thank me. you. So uh, when you look at lines 8 through 15, uh, page 15, it says the, uh, they shall appoint unless the court issues a finding that the appointment is not appropriate. Uh, and then you go down and it says uh, it, it gives the criterion who they're going to appoint. They're going to appoint one or more individuals who have been designated under paragraph 1 unless the court finds that such a qualification is inappropriate. So there's no, there's no um, additional requirement. It is that the court finds that it is inappropriate. And so they can issue, but they have to issue a finding. They're issuing it in writing. Um, I would 
point out that other provisions of this bill, which include legislative oversight of, of these hearings, would also, um, uh, I, I, I believe, deal with exigent circumstances or when you need to deal with an alacrity. You, you're going to have more people watching. I think the court's going to respond uh, uh, appropriately because of that. And, but in this particular instance, uh, the, the ranking member was correct that it's up to the court. I mean, they shall, but if they find it's inappropriate for whatever reason, such as you have a drug dealer or something like that uh, that you're trying to take care of, it <coughs> takes care of the, that. So you'll All, right. All right, and reclaiming my time, the follow-up question, I, and I think the, the gentleman from Colorado discussed this as well, but targets a United States person and... So is the, the sense there that the, the language in the, the, current, the current language is overbroad in some way and needs to be restricted um, because it could go beyond? I guess, the, I guess the point would be there's a potential that an amicus under the, the current language uh, could be appointed even if it doesn't involve a person uh, who is a United States person as the target. So the idea, I'm, I'm at, this is a question, is to, to limit the scope of it so that it, it only targets United States uh, citizens? If, if the, uh, will the gentleman yield? Yes. Um, if the uh, purpose of the uh, application is to target a United States citizen, this uh, uh, section would apply. If it is not targeting a United States citizen, then this section would not apply. And so in my hypothetical, where a cartel member crosses into the United States and receives, um, because the, it's unknown to the government that the person is part of a cartel, receives legal status in this country, this uh, section, the, the court would not have to find one of these exceptions. If the court doesn't find one of the exceptions on page, uh, bottom of page 15 and the top of page 16, the court must appoint, shall appoint uh, an amicus. And that's my objection to this. I want to give the court the... Uh, the discretion. So often the court is reviewing uh, the same type of application and doesn't need a friend of the court to assist the court. And that delay um, in requiring an amicus to be appointed is what I'm trying to avoid with, with this amendment. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. <clears throat> um, I view the first clause of the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado, the shall, um, strike shall and insert may, as kind of converting this to an opt-in versus an opt-out, effectively. Um, we're probably quibbling. Uh, I think you're, the, the, the same result will be reached either way. I probably prefer that it be effectively uh, an opt-out. In other words, you stipulate that you should have the amicus and then create, you know, and then offer the reasons why you shouldn't. Um, I think that is a better place to be for what we're trying to achieve in holding the court accountable to preserve and protect civil liberties. Um, I think it would still achieve the objective of the gentleman from Colorado. I could support the amendment if that first line were removed. And if you're just trying to clarify, I think I could. I think, I mean, subject, subject to current, you know, further debate. If you're all you're trying I, I to- I won't hold you to that commitment. If, uh, I want to, in light of the previous statements, I want to be careful about what I'm committing to. But- for the, the remainder of the lines about the uh, striking presents and inserting targets U.S. person, I could probably get comfortable with that to be very clear that you're talking about targeting U.S. persons, um, but I, I can't support it in its current form with the May, uh, uh, a relimiting shout to a May. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Question occurs on the amendment from the gentleman from Colorado. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Recorded vote. A recorded vote being requested. The clerk call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. 
Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong? No. Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden? Mr. Van Drew? No. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels? Mr. Moore? Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley? Yeah. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman? No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran? Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt? Mr. Fry? No. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Jackson Lee? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Johnson votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Swallow? Mr. Swallow votes aye. Mr. Liu? Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Jayapal votes no. Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Nagoose? Ms. McBath? Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? No. Mr. Ivey votes no. Ms. Ballant? Ms. Ballant votes no. Mr. Gooden? Mr. Gooden votes no. Clerk report. Mr. Chairman, there are four ayes and 22 noes. Uh, the amendment uh, is, is not adopted. Um, the um, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 65. Objection, the amendment will be read, uh, will be considered as read, excuse me, in the, uh, the the Mr. Chairman, lady, I reserve a point of order. General lady from Florida reserves a point of order. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm offering this amendment on behalf of our colleague, Representative Lofgren, who is a leading voice on civil liberties and government surveillance issues in Congress. Unfortunately, she can't be here today. Um, she has expressed support for this, the underlying legislation. She expressed uh, support and encourage this amendment be offered and in deference and respect to her I am offering this amendment and I and uh, the substance of it uh, I agree with uh, but uh, as I as I will explain the amendment would require the government to secure a warrant before searching for information on US persons and data collected under programs authorized by executive order 12333 Representative Lofgren is the Democrat lead of the bipartisan bicameral government surveillance reform act Legislation which lays out comprehensive reforms to surveillance programs across the federal government That bill of which I am a co-sponsor has provided members of this committee with North Star when considering the best approaches to reauthorizing section 702 due to its comprehensive nature Many of its reform proposals are beyond the scope of the legislative jurisdiction of this committee or are not germane to the text under consideration today. In addition to requiring the government to secure a search warrant for information in the 702 database, the GSRA also includes a warrant requirement for government queries of U.S. persons and data collected under EO 12333 programs. EO 12333, which has been on the books since the early Reagan administration, has been a key tool for the intelligence community's data collection and retention programs. While data collected under 12333 presents many of the same challenges as data collected under Section 702 of FISA, including the incidental collection of U.S. persons data, programs under 12333 lack the congressional and judicial oversight mechanisms that I would like to see and which are needed to ensure that the civil liberties of Americans are protected. Concerns exist that if common sense limits are placed on the FBI's ability to conduct backdoor searches of 702 data, Agencies may shift their unconstitutional searches of Americans information to programs that lack, con lack congressional oversight These are not idle concerns as Patrick Eddington of the Cato Institute pointed out a few weeks ago in an op-ed 
Years before the 702 program was authorized, quote, the C Central Intelligence Agency was apparently conducting exactly the kind of an internet backbone surveillance now carried out under FISA Section 702 with absolutely no judicial oversight, close quote. Mr. Chairman, I uh, submit for the record that commentary is the CIA, st CIA still sec secretly capturing Americans' communications. Without objection. The information came to light following a Cato lawsuit under the Freedom of Information Act, which revealed that a CIA program operating during the 90s captured and retained U.S. persons' data seemingly indefinitely, and that retention was not necessarily tied to any actual terrorist threat or espionage investigation. This underlying amendment would ensure that Americans' Fourth Amendment rights are protected no matter what database intelligence agencies are utilizing. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important effort championed by Representative Lofgren and also our friends in the Senate, Rep uh, uh, Senator Wyden and Senator Mike Lee, and also our colleague in the House, Representative Warren Davidson. As I am aware of the germaneness concerns with this amendment, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for letting me raise this, and I will now withdraw it from further consideration, and I yield back. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, who seeks recognition? Mr. Bishop. Um, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Or do you have an amendment at the desk? Yes. I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman has an amendment at the desk. The, the clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6570 offered by Mr. Bishop. Without Mr. objection, the amendment uh, will be considered as read. Point of order reserved by the gentleman from Arizona. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Um, the warrant requirement in the bill, Mr. Chairman, and I'm trying to lay my hands. I got very little notice we were doing this next. Um, the warrant requirement, uh, if uh, as, as, as uh, currently drafted in the ANS, uh, provides that um, um, the warrant will be one that covers the period of the query, but it could be a warrant totally unrelated to a FISA title, uh, a FISA Section 702 database query. Uh, this language, the modification, uh, it, it, it says instead of covering the period of the query, just substitutes the language a warrant authorizing the conduct of the query. So it's straightforward. Uh, it says that what we're after is, in fact, um, to have a court warrant that says probable cause being established, you may search a 702 database. So it's pretty straightforward, simple. I think the very idea here is we've... Gentlemen got broad agreement that there should be a warrant uh, obtained in order to uh, search 702 database. This language would simply achieve that as opposed to a broader situation where any warrant obtained against a person could then be converted to use of uh, this particular database. Gentlemen yield? That I yield. Yeah. Gentlemen yield? Yeah, I yield to the chairman for comment. I think, it, I think it's uh, a clarification that's fine. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll, I'll talk with the ranking member too, but uh, I think that's fine. I yield back to the gentleman. We yield to the chairman? I, I yield to, uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Sorry. Tiffany first. Um, if you'd be so kind, uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, would you read uh, at least the full sentence again and how that is constructed in the context that it's in? I would just like to hear that one more time. Uh, that, that is my objective. I'm to try to understand that right now. In the meantime, perhaps I, Mr. Tiffany, if I yield to Mr. Biggs for his question while we're trying to get my hands on that. Uh, actually, I think I've got it. Is it I'm in the right place? No. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Biggs. I yield to you, and then I'll, we'll find the place. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this, this amendment is, is fine, and the way it reads is... Uh, um, Okay. Pursuant to the federal rules of criminal procedure by a court of competent jurisdiction authorizing the conduct of the query. I think that's appropriate and, and, and a, a good change. And I, Would the gentleman yield? I, I think, Mr. Biggs, I, I'm going to get gentleman Mr. Yield? Tiffany's concern real quick, and then um, uh, I'll come to the ranking member if I could. Sorry, we're a little disorganized here. This is on page four of the ANS, right. uh, and the, uh, uh, the appropriate uh, language is um, 
that uh, subparagraph A shall not apply to a query related to a United States person or a person reasonably believed to be located in the United States at the time of the query or the time of the communication or creation of the information if, and this is, this is a disjunctive thing, such person is the subject of an order or emergency authorization authorizing electronic surveillance or physical search under Section 105 or Section or 304 of this Act, or a warrant issued pursuant to the federal rules of criminal procedure by a court of competent jurisdiction covering, excuse me, authorizing the conduct of the query. Uh, and with that, I yield to the ranking member. Uh, thank, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I just wanted to say I think the amendment is fine. I urge its adoption. Thank you, sir. And with that, question. Uh, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. One seeks recognition. Uh, the question, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, just so that I'm clear, I asked my, my, my colleague from North Carolina, um, authorizing the conduct of the query, I take it, um, references the, the court in referenced in line 20. Um, covering the period of the query, which is the current language. So I, I, let, me, uh, let me phrase it this way. The, I, I took the language covering the period of the query to be uh, addressing a, a time frame, so that's not a, an unlimited period of time where this exception could be applied. Um, and I took the gentleman's language to reference the court that um, would have provided the authorization. So to me, they, they seem to be talking about potentially two different things. And I wanted, I, I'll yield to the gentleman to get his guidance on what his interpretation of that is. I thank the gentleman, and I'm not 100% sure, sure I'm following your, what you're saying, uh, but because the first thing that hung me up is I think the phrase uh, covering, uh, where's my new language? authorizing the conduct of the query. I think that phrase modifies warrant, not court. So a warrant issued pursuant to the rules of criminal procedure by a court of competition, competent jurisdiction authorizing the conduct of the query. Um, I'm, it's eluding me, perhaps you try one more time. I don't see what the covering of the period of the query helps with, and I'm open to that language being included also, but the key for me is that the court's warrant needs to be a warrant that is, you know, we, we ask for warrants, as you know, others may not, but we require things to be searched to be described with reasonable particularity, and I'm not suggesting this is a constitutional requirement. We're fixing something by statute we think should prudentially be fixed, but that's what I'm saying. We want to make sure this warrant is specific to searching the 702 database. So when I say authorizing the query, it is the 702 query. Uh, now, if, if the gentleman believes something else is, is needed there or that I'm losing something by dropping the language. I, I don't know what the language covering the period of the query means exactly. Uh, uh, if I might reclaim my time. Yes, that, that's a fair point. Um, I, I took it to go to staleness, essentially. Um, and just thinking out loud, I suppose that the, the provisions referenced under the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure contain staleness provisions. But I just wanted to make sure I understood that um, the gentleman had time, uh, uh, there's still going to be language that has time constraints on this, this particular warrant. In other words, you know, X, you know, months down the road, whatever the, whatever the warrant was shouldn't still justify something. And, and, and I, I think to the gentleman's point, I believe, although I didn't practice in this area, I believe that the general requirements of probable cause and the issuance of a warrant under general law would cover the concept of staleness as you've just suggested. I don't, I don't know that you can have a warrant issued and then leave it outstanding forever and then have law enforcement rely on it as the basis to do any search. Uh, perhaps since we're trying to fix something that's not really constitutionally required, we ought to have both here to try to fix that too, but it gets pretty, gets pretty difficult. I think what I know we're trying to do is to make sure the court is required, required to have a warrant before we can use 702 data. There's a staleness issue. Maybe it's more, it seems to be more um, 
a more remote or more difficult problem maybe to solve in the if you're going to go back and try to resolve all warrant law, uh, you know, I yield. Fair, fair enough. Reclaiming my time. Well, let me open this up generally then. Is, is there anyone perhaps who was in the negotiations with respect to this at the subcommittee level who understands or has a sense or uh, guide or could provide guidance on the covering the period of the query language? I mean, if I'm, if I'm incorrect about a time constraint, that's fine. But I, 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 I do want to make sure we're not striking language that might still be useful. The gentleman yield. I will yield. I had the same concerns you did uh, initially, but reading it again as it applies to the warrant, what you're talking about is making sure that the period of the warrant covers the period of the query. So you're, you're capturing uh, that one point within the, the, the warrant time frame. It has nothing to do with the actual time frame of the warrant itself, like the, the beginning and the end of the warrant, is just making sure that, that during that window, you cover the query. Does that make sense? I mean, I, 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 I was I, where you I, were, I, but I, I now understand why that, that language um, can be replaced by authorizing the conduct. It's actually more I'll, re I'll, re I'll reclaim, and I apologize to the, the, the chair fine. for You're running fine. over, but the, the only concern I would have about that is that the warrant, the, the scope of the query would be based on the warrant. In other words, so the, the two of them are linked together. So, uh, but with that, I, my time has expired, and I yield. Gentleman yields back the gentleman from Florida. I yield to Mr. Biggs. Thanks. I'm going to see if, see if I can help. I don't know if I can. I'm going to try. But the, I, I take that language as kind of a drafting, trying to find some drafting consistency because it refers ultimately um, here to <clears throat> line seven, well, actually lines 11 through 13, where we're speaking, on that same page, page four, where we're speaking to, uh, you know, shall, well, uh, let's take it from seven. Subparagraph A shall not apply to a query related to a U.S. person or person reasonably believed to be located in the United States at the time of the query or the time of the communication or creation of the information if, and then it goes through, and then it, then it ends up saying covering the period of the query. I think that was, I would suggest, because I don't know, I didn't draft that, but I would suggest when I reviewed it that it was, it was cons making consistent with the timing piece in lines uh, seven through 13. And where that's why I don't have a problem with the authorization authorizing the conduct of the query because I think it's actually inclusive uh, of what you're trying to get at and, and perhaps maybe even makes it more focused. That's just, so I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida yields back. Um, anyone seek recognition on, on the amendment? Um, the question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Um, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Kentucky, Mr. Massey. I have an amendment. Desk. Clerk report. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6570 offered by Mr. Massey of Kentucky. Without, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Kentucky is uh, recognized to offer his amendment. The gentleman from Arizona has reserves a point. Point of order. There was a point of order. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. I'm, off, I'm honored to offer this amendment uh, with uh, Ms. Jayapal as a co-sponsor. And um, Ms. Lofgren, I want to give her credit as the original author of this. She's been diligent. She's been on top of this FISA issue for over a decade since I've, the entire time that I've been here. And Ms. Lofgren and I have worked together on amendments uh, over the years. Some of them we've got passed on the floor. But uh, as Ms. Jayapal said earlier, pretty excited, never thought we would really get to the point that we are, thank you, Mr. Biggs, uh, in terms of getting real reforms and not trying to last minute offer defunding amendments on appropriations bills. We are here in the Committee of Jurisdiction offering substantial legislation that's gonna last the entire reauthorization. So this um, amendment, what it does, is uh, gives us more transparency, and that's going to be key. 
if we're going to do our jobs, which is oversight of this entire process for the next several years, we need oversight. We need the, the information. The government's abuses of Section 702 and other provisions, provisions of FISA came to light as a result of statutory reporting requirements, a statutory requirement that the government declassify and release FISA court opinions and inspector general audits without these enforced transparency and oversight mechanisms. We would have no way and no opportunity to do what we are doing here today, enacting the reforms needed to stop these abuses. Mr. Biggs, underlying bill already has several excellent provisions related to transparency, accountability, and oversight. Our amendment would build on these provisions with some additional audit and reporting requirements. These are common sense, good government provisions. None of them creates any new restrictions on surveillance. They simply aid in ensuring that the existing rules are being complied with and that Americans have the basic information they need to understand the impact of the government surveillance programs. First, our amendment requires an audit by relevant inspectors general of agencies compliance with attorney general approved procedures that govern the collection, dissemination, and retention of US person information obtained outside of FISA. For instance, cell phone location information that intelligence agencies might purchase from data brokers. Although this bill restricts government purchases of many types of sensitive data, it doesn't completely prohibit all such purchases and intelligence agencies may already have significant amounts of this data in their possession. It's important to ensure that any applicable restrictions on access to that data are being enforced. In addition, our amendment expands on existing reporting requirements to provide additional information to Congress and the public. For instance, it would remove the exception in law that currently allows the FBI not to report the number of U.S. person queries it conducts. As we know, the FBI has reported this number for the last two years, and we want to make sure this continues. It would also require the Director of National Intelligence to include some additional information in his or her annual statistic reports. Among other things, the DNI would be required to report information about the subject matter of Section 702 certifications, which the government declassified this year for the first time, the number of people targeted under each certification, and the number of intelligence reports that contain U.S. person identifiers broken down by whether the reports are derived from Section 702 collection or non-FISA collection, and by whether the identities are masked or not masked. There should be no objection to this reporting requirement. Uh, you know, requiring the government to provide this type of information or to task executive branch overseers with assessing whether the government is complying with procedures that govern its handling and use of sensitive information about Americans. In no way does this provision uh, limit our government's ability uh, to collect information, to review this information. It's merely a reporting requirement, and again, offered by my, or authored by uh, first of all, my co colleague, Zoe Lofgren, who has been uh, fastidious and, and diligent um, on these issues. And with that, I yield back to balance my time. Uh, the gentleman yields back to the ranking members recognized. I withdraw my point. I, I oh, the gentleman withdraws the point of order. The ranking members recognize. I thank the gentleman. When I hear a uh, legislative proposal uh, described as common sense, I usually become uh, very suspicious. But, <laughs> but in this case, it is true. I want to thank Mr. Massey for offering this amendment. A central focus of our discussions today has been the vital need and previous lack of transparency in data and information collected by our nation's surveillance apparatus. When intelligence agencies work to gather information, it's our responsibility to ensure they do so in a way that respects the civil liberties and constitutional rights of all U.S. Citizens, persons. This is especially true when the collected data itself concerns American citizens. Mr. Massey's amendment would give us an important insight into the data collected by DNI. This will shed a light on proceedings in FISA courts and other surveillance mechanisms to ensure they are fair and operating as they are intended, bringing accountability to a court system that has traditionally operated without sufficient transparency. So I support the amendment and urge everyone else to do so. I yield back. The chair recognizes the um, sponsor. Gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, rise in support for of this amendment. I think it's a great amendment, and uh, I'm going to just be quick and say, let's all vote for it, please. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman. 
I'm going to go here and then I'll come to you. Gentlelady from uh, Washington is recognized and I'll come to you, Ms. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I rise in strong support of Mr. Massey's amendment uh, to strengthen accountability and transparency over surveillance authorities. And I just want to take a minute to recognize how we got here, which is in part because we had transparency and accountability. Um, you know, this bill is a critically important bill that would require the government to get a warrant before searching for Americans' communications because during the last 702 reauthorization, we in Congress insisted that the intelligence community publicly report on surveillance targeting Americans. We had been told to stop uh, asking for this warrant requirement. We were told not to worry about it. Um, but we did, and we found out that the FBI alone made nearly 3.4 million queries of Americans just in 2021. 3.4 million warrantless searches on Americans. And thanks to that public accountability, the FBI then took steps to reduce warrantless U.S. person searches, resulting in the number, yes, dropping to over 204,000 in 2022. And while the FBI and others tout that number to push for FISA reauthorization with very few changes, it is still a problem. We're talking about over 500 warrantless searches of Americans every day. That means that every five years, if that were to continue without any changes that we're proposing today, that means that every five years, the FBI would have conducted one million more of these warrantless searches, which is exactly why we're able to get to where we got to, because we got that information. So I've been very proud to work with members on the other side to crack down on these warrantless searches and our efforts are really impossible to ignore because we demanded that transparency in 2018. So this amendment allows us to continue to conduct oversight over surveillance activities. It would strengthen the already excellent provisions in the bill on transparency, accountability, and oversight by requiring the DNI to report on certifications issued under Section 702, statistics on who is being targeted, the people that are being targeted, intelligence reports containing identifiers of US persons. This is basic information. I think it's our job in Congress to know if intelligence investigations are having a disparate impact on constitutionally protected classes, whether it's based on race or religion or political views. Protecting our democracy is a duty that we all take seriously and it cannot come at the cost of trampling foundational rights to privacy and civil liberties that are enshrined in our Constitution. As members of Congress, we have a responsibility to stand up for the civil liberties of our constituents, and that starts with doing the most basic oversight and transparency, requiring transparency from the intelligence community to ensure that those rights are protected and upheld at every turn. So I thank Mr. Massey for offering the amendment and allowing me to co-sponsor it. I thank Ms. Lofgren for her work on it. Um, and I thank all of our colleagues for just continuing to have uh, this very good, rational, reasonable discussion um, towards the goals that we all are working for. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we, uh, as uh, the gentleman from Kentucky was giving his presentation on this amendment, uh, the thing that ran through my mind was cost-benefit analysis. And I think about all the reports that we require to be generated here in the Congress of the United States, and I oftentimes question the value of the re those reports. And so I have a question for the gentleman from Kentucky, if he would be so kind as to answer it is, you know, how do you answer that question? Okay, here we get another report. Is it going to be a value? Um, uh, is it going to be a value? Well, uh, my short answer to that is what, what price do you place on civil liberties? Uh, it's, that's a rhetorical answer to a question that uh, I think that these reports are only worthwhile if we read them. And I think we do get too many reports on things that we don't pay attention to. And um, to the gentleman's point, I assure you that as long as I'm in Congress and as long as uh, Ms. Lofgren and Mr. Jaipal is here, we are gonna be paying attention to these reports. Do you think we take uh, any of the agencies away from their duties by having them create another report, have more people that are creating reports? I think if uh, the result of having more reports as they do less spying on uh, Americans without a warrant, then I would double the number of reports. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Pennsylvania seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady's recognized. Thank you. 
Uh, I strongly support this bill, and I'm really proud of this committee's ability to come together on a bipartisan package to reform our government surveillance techniques. I echo the comments of many of my colleagues. We need to reauthorize Section 702. We need this tool to prevent threats against the U.S. and to combat terrorism. But we also need constitutional guardrails. We need to respect the Fourth Amendment, and we need to protect Americans' privacy from government surveillance. This bill is a sensible package of reforms to bring government surveillance into compliance with the Constitution. It provides meaningful reforms to stop the abuse of surveillance authorities by the FBI and other agencies in our intelligence community. It requires the intelligence community to observe the constitutional uh, dictates of the Fourth Amendment and seek probable cause before they look at Americans' data. So to me, these are very sensible reforms that should be the absolute minimum for any reauthorization of Section 702. And I'm really grateful to Mr. Massey. I think his uh, amendment is a good addition um, to this bill, to the underlying bill, because as Ms. Jayapal just mentioned, um, many of the abuses that we seek to correct with this reform package were actually disclosed through some of the reporting uh, requirements that Congress imposed in the past. So. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, I appreciate your work to put together a bipartisan bill that represents a consensus between Democrats and Republicans on protecting Americans' privacy, and I yield back. For purposes, gentlemen from Texas, seek your recognition. Strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. Yeah, I would just like to offer my strong support um, for this amendment offered by the gentleman from Kentucky and, and co-sponsored by Democrat colleagues and with support from other Democrat colleagues. Um, I think it's much more important than we think. And to the gentleman from Wisconsin's point about reports, I'm no fan of our uh, frequent go to the floor and offer some reports as basically cover for doing something, okay? I'm not a big fan of that. In the context of very specific purposes, to ensure oversight on executive branch in protection of civil liberties and our constitutional rights, regardless of one's political views, it's hard to be over-demanding enforcing reports out of the executive branch for how they're carrying out their authority, particularly in this context, uh, particularly where the broad authorities of the executive branch with respect to foreign engagement, national security, uh, where there is a great deal of power in the executive branch under the Constitution, this is the area where I would say is maybe the most important for con critical congressional oversight. And I want to add another context to this because I think there's going to be another amendment coming up shortly that I'm offering that requires monthly reporting in my amendment. And there's some debate back and forth about whether that's too burdensome. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the context here, I think, matters. We are putting in our bill a uh, warrant requirement, right, with respect to uh, U.S. persons being queried in a 702 database. Uh, we are doing that over the objections of the intel community, both members of this body uh, predisposed in that direction, as well as the intel organizations themselves. We are doing that because we are expressing our interest as Congress that we put that additional layer of protection in place uh, to protect civil liberties. Given the exchange had yesterday with Senator Lee and FBI, FBI Director Christopher Wray, in which Senator Lee highlighted the extent to which it was reported in the PCLOB reports on civil liberties, uh, the extent to which, and I'm quoting, particularly troubling is that the FBI has never once submitted an application to the FISC pursuant to Section 702F2, uh, in which the warrant requirement actually applied. Um, that's an actual problem, where under our current laws, a warrant requirement is in place, and the executive branch is plainly ignoring it. On page 188 of the report that I'm looking at, which I've asked to be submitted to the record by the PCLOB. Without objection. You see in 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022, a total of 103 examples of cases where uh, the reports to the FISC as required by court orders um, that we didn't actually have the warrants being submitted, and that's a problem. And so I think these reports, like the gentleman from Kentucky are offering, are critically important for Congress to assess whether or not the executive branch is following the law. 
In a moment, I'll be offering an amendment to make a very narrow section of the reporting requirements. That is how many warrants are being offered, how many queries have been hitting a database on US persons. I want that on a monthly basis. I'll be honest with you, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. I want it on a minute by minute basis, but that might be cumbersome. The point here is- The gentleman uh, yield. The gentleman yield. I, I, I'll yield, sure. I, I just want to say that, uh, as you may recall, last time we reauthorized the bill, we got rolled by the Intel Committee. Yeah. Hmm. And their warrant requirement was designed not to be enforced. Correct. In the bill that we have before us, I agree. We have very good enforcement mechanisms. And, and I and I would and I thank the gentleman for that. And I agree that the enforcement requirements in this make it more likely, more likely that they will be followed. But let's just say my trust level is not high. Well, the gentleman and so my my perspective here is that to a degree we are punting our responsibility to Article Three. We are punting our responsibility to the FISC. And I, I don't mean that as a, as a negative. I'm just saying, let me rephrase that to say we are over-relying on Article 3 and the FISC court. And I want to increase the reliance on Article 1 review of what's going on. Understanding that the amicus curiae, understanding that some other provisions we put in there insert us more into it. I want the, every member of Congress to be able to basically have alarm bells going off. So we'll get into that amendment in a minute, but I strongly support this amendment on an annual basis, providing more granular detail, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back for purposes of gentlelady from Indiana seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate uh, Representative Massey doing this amendment, and I really like the rationale. Maybe they don't have enough, uh, you know, much time then to harass Americans. So I really like that. I think one thing, and I will address one in my amendment a little bit later on, we have a lot of reporting, which is great, but we really don't have a system for us to look at these reports, and it's very hard to find these reports and take action. So we also need to think about it, how we cannot just look every once every five years at these reports when we do reauthorization, but how we can have more timely responses and set up Congress to deal with this. So I think it's very important to have you know, a separate person also doing this report, but we need to think and maybe these people, we should have a specific hearings where these reports will be discussed and presented, and we can do that, but maybe we need to start mandated some of these hearings, which will force us to look at these reports, because if you look at, uh, look at the uh, PCLOB report, that is very alarming that uh, the, um, a lot of re recommendations and a lot of conclusions as they reach by reviewing this and how many rights of Americans been violated and we turn into surveillance states. So I am very much supportive of this. I think it's very good to have additional reports and hopefully uh, it will force some of the um, in, in people in the intelligence committee to think twice maybe before they decide to do these queries, because they decide to do these procedures because they've been taken very lightly and been abused significantly. And I think, you know, this is, we are turning into being a police and surveillance state, which is very, very dangerous. And I am very happy to see we have a support on the bipartisan basis because this issue shouldn't be partisan. We have a lot of partisan issues, but I appreciate that actually people on the left and on the right can agree on some issues. And, you know, and we don't have to go very far in amendments. We actually can agree on the force. So uh, I certainly support this amendment. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. I, I, I just, like to, just like to add that the importance of reports is not just who might read them, but their influence on those who write them. Um, it's a reminder that there is oversight, however imperfect, and it puts them on notice that at any given time that agency may be called to account for the activities that it is reporting, and that is a very good thing. I yield back. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree with you, and I yield back. Generally, anyone seek recognition? Question occurs on the amendment from the gentleman from Kentucky. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Um, who seeks recognition? The gentleman from Texas. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 657. Objection to the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Arizona reserves a point of order, and the gentleman from Texas is recognized. <laughs> Thank the chairman, um, and I may not need to use the entire five minutes because I laid the foundation 
in the context of the previous amendment, which I wholly support. Um, that amendment has a much more granular and more detailed requirement of information that is required to be presented to Congress on an annual basis. That is a very good thing. It allows us to analyze what's actually happening. Are you guys comfortable with The one thing that I think is important here is while I agree with what the ranking member said about the civil penalties and the uh, criminal penalties being in this bill and other provisions that are likely to encourage a greater adherence to the requirements which have been ignored, right? As I pointed out in the exchange between Senator Mike Lee and Christopher Wray yesterday over in the Senate, literal warrant requirements being just blatantly ignored. My concern here is depending on what happens here and in the Intel Committee and the floor in the Senate, with 12 triple three in executive orders, with the possibility always of a rubber stamping of warrants, which could end up being the case, uh, we or, or the ignoring of the requirements in some form or fashion, we don't know how our, our best efforts here will play out, right? We're drafting something that likely we won't readdress for another five years. There's a reason we're doing this right now. It's because we have to. And so my point is, and I was trying to allude to it before, we in Congress need to be more actively engaged in this particular question because it's a fundamental duty for us to check the executive branch. And, and I understand there's provisions in here, like I said, with the amicus curiae. There's also, there's provisions, you know, for us to have two uh, uh, members, you know, at the designation uh, of the chairman um, in the room as needed and staff. That's good. But we know how this place works. We know how this town works. We know how busy everybody gets. We know how busy members are. Staff, then staff who end up in the room can often end up getting sucked into the vortex of the mood in the room to go after bad actors and to say, you want to go do this, right? Those of us who've been prosecutors have seen that, where you get into that mentality. All I want here is a minimal amount of information on a more regular basis. Like I said, I'd like to have my phone chime Did every you? single, in one second, every single time a U.S. query is made, right? And I can go, huh, why the hell is that going on? Now, that's a little absurd. <laughs> that might be a little much. I guess my point is, meant psychologically speaking, that's where my head is. So to me, a monthly report on this very minimal subset of information about whether warrants have been uh, you know, carried out or whether or not uh, you know, the number of queries is just a way that you know, we get it in January or February or March. We're just not waiting for an annual basis to say, hey, what in the hell are you guys doing? Right? Are you implementing this? And I know there's going to be some pushback on the burden. Eh, I mean, come on. They're going to be collecting the data to report it annually. Um, I think having that same staffer who's going around collecting it, going around to the U.S. courts and talking to the Fisk judges and whatever, however that will happen, we can all figure that out. You collect the information and then you report it to us on a monthly basis. And then our staffers in the room and our, our appointed members in the room now have more information. And frankly, we, the general members, now have at least a monthly check without with all due respect, having to rely on the appointed two members or staffers. We have control as the 435 members of Congress to see that report and be able to ex exercise our duties on that. And I'll yield to the ranking member who asked, had a question or a point. Thank you. I, I just want to say, uh, I think monthly reports are impractical. You want to rein in the FBI and not tie its hands with red tape. I worry this amendment would tip the scales away from practical reforms, but I understand the desire for more information. Would you consider making this a quarterly report? A quarterly report I, mean, I could support. I, I would prefer it be monthly um, because I don't, I mean, because like I said, I said <laughs> my position was I would, I would prefer it be instantaneous. Um, because again, I don't, I don't generally trust the apparatus monthly, to work. But could, you, could you accept quarterly? If I, I, I could certainly uh, be willing to accept the friendly goal of comedy of, of achieving quarterly. If it would, if it would be, yes. you know, received, but I, I do want to at least stipulate, I will be proven correct that we would be better off if we were getting it more often than quarterly, and that the bureaucratic demands on the staff to collect it is not that significant. So I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be uh, amended to say quarterly. 
Without objection. <clears throat> Mem the amendment is uh, so amended. Uh, I would just, the gentleman yields back. Uh, I would just point out that uh, the, in the gentleman's statement, he said a more regular basis and more detailed information. Mr. Nadler's amendment and your, they, they cover that. So we've got the more detailed basis from the previous amendment, more, reg, uh, more regular basis in this amendment, and we are continuing our bipartisan march forward on this legislation. Uh, the amendment is agreed to, or, well, let me bring it up. Uh, uh, w anyone else wish to the speak amendment, on the amendment? The amendment is agreed to. The question occurs on the amendment to the, uh, uh, um, the amendment as amended. on the amendment as amended. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Um, and the uh, amended amendment is agreed to. The chair now recognizes. Uh, we don't have to do that. We can just wait. The gentlelady from uh, Wyoming. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment would, at the would, desk. Uh, would, the, would the gentlelady just suspend for just a second? Uh, the chair, chair recognizes the ranking member for uh, quite a portion of privilege, I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, my colleague Zoe Lofgren has been cited repeatedly here today as a leader in this, as she has been for many years. I just want to note that her absence is because she couldn't be here today because she has COVID, unfortunately. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We wish Ms. Uh, uh, Lofgren a speedy recovery. And again, like everyone has said, we appreciate her work on this issue for so, uh, so many years. Gentle ladies, recognize she has an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 6570 offered by Ms. Hageman of Wyoming. Uh, the, uh, Point of order from the gentleman from Arizona. The gentlelady from uh, Wyoming is recognized for, uh, to speak on her amendment. Thank you. Uh, the amendment that I am proposing as currently drafted would amend 50 U.S.C. 1871, which requires the Attorney General to report to the Intelligence and Judiciary Committees of the House and Senate on a semi-annual basis on persons targeted by FISA Title I surveillance orders. The amendment strengthens this reporting to cur this reporting to curb past abuses by requiring the AG to disclose the identity of any person who is targeted, who is associated with a candidate for president of a major party, and it also adds the Speaker and Minority Leader of the House and Majority and Minority Leader of the Senate as report recipients. The intention of this amendment is to deter future abuse and provide for oversight into the process. Current reporting requirements do not inform Congress when the intelligence community is using FISA against campaign staff. Not only would Congress now receive this information, but it would likely detour the FBI from opening an unwarranted case against an American based on their political affiliation, because the agency would have to alert some of the highest elected members of that person's party. The heads of each party would be able to watch over their people to prevent abuse. In 2019, the DOJ Inspector General reported on the abuses and missteps in the FISA orders obtained for Crossfire Hurricane, finding 17 significant errors or omissions and 51 wrong or unsupported factual assertions in the applications that allowed Carter Page to be illegally surveilled for 11 months. These findings were confirmed in the Durham report this committee received testimony on earlier this year and also found that political and confirmation bias led the FBI to lie to the FISC in order to improperly spy on a president's campaign. Abuses of FISA have made their way into our electoral system, and every member on this die and in this body should be concerned about federal law enforcement's and the intelligence community's proven ability to interfere in our election process. These abuses could happen to any party, candidate or campaign staffer, depending on influences within the FBI versus domestic political movements. My amendment seeks to serve as a deterrent to these abuses in the future by in injecting transparency in the process. 
If there was a desire to seek a FISA order against an American affiliated with a political campaign for nefarious reasons, the FBI would need to decide its commit commitment to such an effort if it had to report the investigations to some of the highest elected party leads, leaders in our system of government. If such an order was sought and granted, congressional leaders would be made aware that the candidate running for president as a member of, the, of the member of their party was being surveilled. Such oversight can lead to corrective action. At the same time, congressional leaders of the opposing party would also be notified that the federal government is surveilling their political opposition hopefully giving them pause about allowing government surveillance of their opponents as they, that they would be aware of going forward. Mr. Chairman, this is a great bill, and, I will make, and it will make meaningful reform to protect the constitutionally secured rights of our constituents, including reforms to address the shortcomings and illegal action revealed in the IG and Durham reports. The expansion of the amicus into sensitive investigative matters is a step in the right direction to address some of these past abuses. My amendment seeks to take this reform one step further by strengthening reporting requirements. If passed and combined with, combined with the other reforms in this bill, all Americans who want to use their First Amendment rights to support political parties and candidates could exercise those rights to the fullest without the fear that this affiliation would be the basis for government surveillance. And with all that said, I also understand the balance that has been struck on this particular bill. So I will withdraw my amendment, but hope that we can continue to pursue much need of FISA and Section 702 reform in the future. Thank you. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. We appreciate the gentle uh, lady's um, uh, comments on the bill and, and uh, her amendment. The chair now recognizes the gentle lady from Indiana, Ms. Sparks. I have amendment at the desk. Uh, the lady designate, will the gentleman designate her amendment? Uh, did someone give it to you? I don't have the amendment related to uh, the audit. The audit one? Okay. As long as the clerk has it, we can, the clerk, yeah. okay. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 6570 offered by Mrs. Sparts of Indiana. Without objection, the amendment we consider is read. The gentle lady's point of, uh, uh, can is, we get the copy of it? While you're waiting for the, the copy of the amendment, I'm going to create this. It's a very simple amendment. So what it does, so I think we're rightly adding annual audit of FISA compliance by Inspector General because we do need to have more independent eyes on the processes because there are a lot of uh, audits that are done by you know, self-reporting by Department of Justice, a lot of uh, audits that, uh, you know, the FISC does is they're kind of ad hoc, so I think it's important for us to have uh, Inspector General do an audit, so it's a very good part of the bill that we're doing on page 29. So what I really have seen in a lot of ways, we do a lot of these audits, but they never really reviewed and presented when we have oversight hearings and never discussed. So it's a, they, they, you know, we have reporting for the sakes of reporting, not action. So what it does, it says, when we have Attorney General come in our oversight hearing and talking about, um, you know, oversight of uh, the Department of Justice is doing, including oversight of FBI and all of the other things it's supposed to do, they also should discuss this Inspector General audit report and see if what was done and what it's done, but it's important for us to bring attention because yes, it is a very material issue that we'll actually have a discussion of this uh, during our oversight hearing with uh, Attorney General and this Inspector General report I actually looked at by the executive branch and remediation or other actions reported are happening and they can talk to us about that. So it's a very simple amendment, all it just says, and. When Attorney General comes to oversight here in, in the House and the Senate, Attorney General shall, shall discuss this Inspector General report on uh, annual audit of FISA. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Does the gentleman insists on his point of order. The gentleman, gentleman withdraws. The chair recognizes. I recognize the ranking member. Thank you. The, uh, there's already, I, I oppose the amendment is unnecessary, basically. There's already a reporting requirement. Um, 
the Attorney General already comes annually to the Judiciary Committees, and if he's required to report this anyway, and if he doesn't report it adequately, you can ask him a question. Uh, so I, I just think it's unnecessary. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Yeah, but it's not in the statute that Attorney General shall actually. So I want to make sure that when the Attorney General come here, he or she is prepared to actually do that. Because if it is in the code and the part of the hearing, and Attorney General is what will be discussed, we have more meaningful discussions because they will have to be referring to this report that they should be reviewing. Otherwise, Attorney General will sit in this committee and say, well, I'll get well, back, I'll do this, and it never happens. Reclaiming, reclaiming so that's my time. why it, it, it's important for them to be familiar with that report. I'm lost the gentleman. My time, New York. It, it, it would be improper for Congress to mandate that the committee hold a hearing on a particular subject. No, I normally do anyway. No, but, but General, you'll, this is not a committee. Wait, 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 wait. The gentleman controls the time. Yeah. But, but that's what it would do. I'll yield. Gentlemen, ladies, recognize. Uh, well, this is actually not. We already have oversight here, and all it says, it's not new hearing. It's nothing required. We already have an attorney general doing the hearing. So as a part of the hearing, attorney general should you know, discuss this Inspector General report. So he needs to say, you know, based on my assessment, so that we need to make sure that Ex Attorney General is looking at this report and addressing with Congress, because ultimately, if we want to do oversight functions, we need to make sure that somebody's taking actions. So all it says that they need to discuss already. Reclaim, it doesn't require any hearing. Reclaiming, reclaiming okay. my time. Well, this is my time. I was. No, 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 it's still, it's still Mr. Nadler's time. time. Okay, my then, time. yeah. Let me just say. If the Attorney General comes before the committee every year, if he doesn't discuss this, we can always ask him questions about it. I just don't see what the point of this amendment is. Yeah, what we're putting into statute, something that, 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 that happens. That if it doesn't happen, we ask the questions. He's got to be prepared for it. The gentleman yield. Uh, I'll yield to the chairman. Uh, I, I appreciate the ranking member, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the gentleman from Indiana, and, and I know the objectives she wants, but I, I do think the ranking member makes a good point. The IG is already obligated to come to, to give us information. We just adopted two amendments <clears throat> that said he has to do that now. Excuse me. <clears throat> we have to get that information on a quarterly basis, and the information that comes to us has to be more detailed, more of what we want to see. Uh, the Attorney General does come. I think the Attorney General is going to be on notice that the Judiciary Committee wants to ask uh, him or her, whoever that happens to be at the time, the, whoever the Attorney General is, questions about the FISA law and how it, how it works. When we have him next year, I'll even, I'll even, uh, uh, we can write the letter. I bet Mr. Nadler would sign it. Yep. We'll make it a letter from Ms. Sparts, the gentlelady from Indiana, saying, when you come, Mr. Attorney General, be ready to answer these questions on FISA and on 702, whatever we want to, but we can put him on notice. He better be prepared so he doesn't get what you and I have all experienced where he says, oh, I'll have to get, get back with you. So I appreciate what the lady's doing. I, I don't necessarily think that the amendment is necessary. With that, I yield back to the ranking member. I, I, I'll just say I agree. It, it's, it's just unnecessary to put it into statute. Um, and we should every year ask the Attorney General before he comes in to be prepared to talk about uh, FISA and 702. I'm sure we will. I yield back. Anyone seek, who seeks recognition on the amendment? Uh, the question occurs on the amendment from the gentlelady from uh, uh, Indiana. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Um, the amendment is not adopted. Um, anyone else seek recognition on? Okay, <laughs> you're, very, you're very nice. I appreciate it, Victoria. <laughs> um, okay. <coughs> does? The gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania wishes to speak on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. And, uh, and we'll just strike the last word. Strike the last word. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I want to say that um, I, I'm really heartened by what has gone on here uh, over the course of many years, but also uh, recent weeks, uh, a coming together in this committee over something extremely important. I rise in support of H.R. 6570, the Protect Liberty and Endless Warrant Surveillance Act, reforming 
the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, known as FISA. Uh, as lawmakers and members of the Judiciary Committee, it's our job to strike the right balance between often competing interests. Today, we, make, we must safeguard both our national security as well as our constitutional rights of privacy. Uh, when you take a look at the history and what has been learned uh, through the reporting, that in 2021, for example, the FBI made nearly 3.4 million uh, queries of U.S. persons. It's st stunning and shocking. And yes, while they have recognized it uh, and have made some reforms on their own, it is our job uh, to make sure we hold them uh, to a far greater standard as they protect our national security. Uh, I'm encouraged that so many members on both sides uh, of this hearing room take this responsibility seriously when it comes to FISA Section 702, appalling overuse of this powerful tool, which went unchecked and unaudited for too long, must stop. The warrant requirement and other key provisions at the heart of this bipartisan bill will leave American civil rights better defended as we still allow the agencies to do the important work of keeping us safe. I urge my colleagues to join me in support of these essential reforms. And I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Anyone else seek recognition on? The question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. As amended, this will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Reporting quorum being present. The question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. Again, all those in favor say aye. Aye. <clears throat> those opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. The sponsor of the legislation, the subcommittee chair with jurisdiction, asks for a recorded vote. The clerk will, recall, uh, will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Issa. <laughs> Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes yes. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman. Aye. Ms. Hageman votes aye. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes aye. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Swallow. Mr. Swallow votes no. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Mr. Issa votes aye. Ms. Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Liu votes aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Fry, you're not recorded. Mr. Fry votes aye. I know we have a few more members trying to get back, but I want to thank those who were here and participated in the debate and, and, and the discussions over the last 
a few months. Thank you again. This is, uh, um, I think, a very good product that we, go, we expect to be on the House floor uh, next week. Um, but we're going to hold the roll open to make sure anyone who wants to come back and vote, um, from, from particularly the Transportation Committee, can get back in time. Other than that, there'll be no further business for the committee. Andy, good job. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Are we waiting? Hey, who are we waiting on? Jim Johnson. Mr. Johnson, you are not recorded. Mr. Johnson votes no. Okay. Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Van Drew votes um, yes. Gentlelady lady from. Miss yeah. Bush votes aye. Mr. Nagoose, no. you're not recorded. Sorry. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. <coughs> Can we, um, are we waiting? But can we close out the vote now? The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be proposed. Well, we did that. Does any member wish to? No. Okay. 
No, no, this is it. Yeah, we were right here. Uh, right here, right here, right here, right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are there any members uh, who wish to vote, who haven't voted? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 35 ayes and two noes. Uh, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Does any member wish to give notice of an intent to file views on this bill pursuant to House Rule 11, <clears throat> Clause 2? Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. This concludes committee's business for the meeting. The meeting is adjourned. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, now it's up.